Oh, we're not yet. We'll go live. Hi everybody. Um, you should be seeing us now with a 30 second delay because that's just the way it, work. it works. Um, thank you so much for joining us for an amazing second day. You were amazing yesterday. We got so much engagement and so many good reviews. So thank you, thank you so, so much. Um, as you know, this uh, 15 minutes are just our introduction time and just the time that we give for everybody to um, to come and log into YouTube because it's a Sunday morning and some people might be late. Meanwhile, on our screen, you can see the Slido code. Please do not send us 500 times your question. I hope we will, I swear we will get to it. Um, but if you spam it, we actually won't. Um, apart from that, there's all of our socials. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. That's where we post all of our events, all of our initiatives. Um, there's also our sponsors, Medify, MDU, and Medical Protection Services, and our itinerary. As you can see today, we will talk about BMAT, UCAT, how to become a medical school, mental health and social experiences in medical school, and what to do if ever you're rejected from medicine. There's also some QR codes, which you can scan to give us a review. If you were here yesterday, please give us five stars. It really helps. And then uh, the year 11 and year 12 and 13 sign up. If you are in year 12 and 13, you will be matched to a mentor soon, whereas the year 11s will wait until the next academic year and then be matched at the beginning of the next academic year with their mentor and um, have their mentor with them for two years if they wish so. Um, so I hope I haven't missed out on anything. Charms, Gabs, Mayuri, um, say um, something if I have. Sorry, um, there's just a technical issue that I need to um, change. So I just need to stop sharing screen for Okay, a bit. that's fine. And... Oh yeah, something else that we missed is that basically when you guys join us, um, you can you can click the live button on YouTube uh, just to start watching it all over again. Because of course, if you join like midday or whatever um, and you wanna start the talks from the beginning, you can just click the live button um, and watch us real time. Um, so hopefully, uh, you can find the live button next to the mute button if you are wondering and hopefully you can do that smoothly and thank you so much there's already almost 200 of you watching us as i said we're gonna wait for a while just for everyone to get here and yeah we can take some some questions do not send 500 <laughs> guys some okay oh my god already so many questions Okay, so will you please share the recording of yesterday's event? Thank you. Yes, when the weekend is done, we will put that, like all of our talks, on our website. Please um, check those out as well. I'm answering some of the ones for you, like the links ones. Thank you I'll so, so them. much, Mayuri. That's wonderful news. Next up, as the post-conference form link for yesterday being posted, that is on our YouTube description. So please find it there. However, do not fill today's conference form link because the conference for today hasn't started yet, right? It makes sense. Hello, is it true that GCSEs straight nines have less words for current year 12s as there was an inflation in nines for our year group? Um, thank you for your question. Unfortunately, as we said yesterday, we are medical students and we aren't part of the admission team or the selection panel for medical students school so I cannot answer you with a yes or a no simply because I don't know okay 
Is it a must to get the teacher email for the one-to-one -one mentorship? Yes, please. We need your teacher's email because we need to tell them what you're up to because of safeguarding reasons. You guys are minors and we are adults, apparently, at least age-wise. So um, we have to protect you. Is that all right? And good morning, the QR code for the post-conference yesterday wasn't working. Will I still get the certificate? Please fill the form, which is in our YouTube description. I think it's also in today's YouTube description. Let me check that. Yeah, to ask questions, Google review, post-conference feedback form, the blog posts, and the bitlies. Everything is in our YouTube description. Okay, guys? I've just so, put it up as a poll on Slido so that okay. people are aware. It's like comes up as a big announcement saying, please see the YouTube Perfect. description. All of the it's island. also on Slido, guys. Um, Thank Anna. you, Mayuri. That's super helpful. Yes, Charles. So, so at the end of today or tomorrow, I will be sending out emails to every single person who is attending this conference as well as those who registered the links for all the feedback forms, free conference form if you want to sign and if, if you want to join our giveaway by Medify. And it will include um, a form about something else that we will be introducing later on in this conference. So do stay on and look at our holding slides during the break. And at the end, I'll be introducing it again. And I will also be talking about the giveaway in our in the email that I'll be sending out. So please do not try to not ask again and spam the slide over questions about feedback forms because I will be sending out emails to every single one of you. Thank you, Shams. That's very helpful. And then a very cute like if you enjoyed yesterday's event. Thank you, guys. If you enjoyed, apart from liking, also leave us a review because that's really helpful to us. Does your first choice have to have higher requirements? Generally, that's what people do simply because if you don't meet the higher requirements, then you can fall back on your insurance choice, which generally is a lower requirement, but it's up to you. And people are asking what the teacher involves. Basically, what for the mentor scheme, basically when you get matched up, we just email them being like, hi, just so you know what your pupil is, is um, up to. They've signed up for this mentor scheme and we've matched them. If you want, we can send you the DBS of the mentor so you know that they're clear to work for kids type of thing. Mm -hmm. And, oh, that's it. Okay, guys, grab a cup of tea. We're almost all here and then we will welcome you and we'll start the talks. Is that all right? And somebody's asking, how long does it take to be accepted by a mentor? It takes minimum two weeks. Sometimes it takes shorter, but please give us at least two weeks, particularly because now we're being all busy with the conference. But also, don't assume that if you apply, you qualify for it, as only the people that respect our widening participation criteria actually get to be matched with a mentor. And I'm also answering some questions in the chat, the more personal one. And what happens if you're rejected from firm and insurance? And is it okay to have a backup plan? Guys, thank you for these questions. Why do you want to spoil our day though? Because as you can see from one to two, there will be a talk called rejections, what to do next. And that's where we will talk about the things that you can do if you're rejected or the backup plans that you can have. So hopefully that's all right. And yes, today you will also get the certificate of attendance just like yesterday, okay? And hello, can you explain why you have to pick four courses and one fifth choice? Because 60% of the people that apply to medicine 
do not even make it for one interview. So it's the stats are quite clear that it's very competitive to get into medicine. And UCAS doesn't want you guys to have applied to five medical schools and then have nothing like no backup plan. And that's why they require you to put down four medicine choices and one other choice that you can always make in case you don't get into medical school. Okay. On A-level results day, can you find out if you got into med school before opening your results? I believe med schools get told earlier because they get sent the results automatically. However, do not quote me on this because I didn't do A-levels, but I did the IB. Um, so I received my grades much earlier than my offer. Uh, Anna, about you guys? And I just actually answered that question. Oh, so thank you. Uh, so it depends when you're collecting your results. Yeah. Um, usually UCAS goes live early in the morning. So for example, if your results come out, I don't know, in the afternoon, but you're collecting, but you're opening UCAS at 8 a.m., everyone tries to log in at that time. So it could crash. Mm -hmm. But technically, because the med school have gotten your grades ahead of time, you could log into UCAS and see that you've been accepted or rejected before cool. you actually collect your results from the school. Um, which does sometimes happen, quite often actually happen. Um, and yeah, obviously, if you've been accepted, that kind of gives you an indication that you probably did make your offer and got your grades. If you don't, then it gives you a suspicion that maybe something has gone wrong with the grades. But again, it is variable, but you, you can see it depending on when your results come out during the day. Hope that answers that question. Yeah, that's great to know. And somebody's Anna, asking, oh, yes, Mayuri, please. If please. you um, go on Slido, you should see that one of the questions are in blue. I'll highlight the ones that you should answer in blue. Yeah, and that's also, great. Someone called Val has said that you're amazing. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Val. That's very kind. So um, I'm going to answer one more question before the blue question. Every conference I have attended gives out certificates. Can I ask why, and if medicine doesn't require a portfolio, why are certificates important? Well, first of all, it's important for you guys to make a collection of everything you do so that you can keep track of what you do. But also, after you get into medicine, you will understand how important portfolios are. So this is something I wish I knew before medicine to answer the blue, the blue question. I wish I knew from the first day that I had to keep track of the things I've done because now I remember some things I've done in first year and I'm like, wow, that would have been super, super helpful to have a certificate off, but I just didn't chase it or I just didn't ask for it at that time. However, when you are in medical school, you'll find yourself applying for maybe committee positions um, like a national committee, for example, into med school or just society committees in your, in, in your medical school. And it's nice to have a track record of everything you've done so that you can mention why you are so qualified for something. Um, and at the same time, certificates are also very important when you want to apply for something like the academic foundation program, where they ask you how many um, conference presentations you've done, how many publications you've had, how many awards you've received. And for example, I can tell you about something else that is called the core surgical training, which is for people that after medical school, when they're old, want to do surgery. And they are scored on something called commitment to surgery and a way that you can show commitment to a particular specialty or a particular field is for example, by attending conferences. So that's basically a summary of why certificates are important. Um, girls, and Rehan is also here. Does anyone want to add anything? Oh, Rehan and Lee, so it's guys now. Um, does anyone want to add anything on the importance of certificates? Or another very, very good question is, what is something you would have liked to have known before going to medical school? So if you guys want to answer. Charms, go for it. One thing I would have liked to have known, 
I guess just knowing what it'd be like in medicine. Um, I think the one thing that I really asked was, um, like, how would you study in medicine? How would you revise? What are the, what are the exams like? What's the learning style like? And I think the biggest answer that I got was, it depends. <laughs> a lot of people just said, you know, it depends on who you are as a person, how you tackle it and how you basically find your own style. So it's very personalized. It is not, it's not something that someone can basically tell you. But yeah. Um, I, I think, an, oh, go on, Lee. Very up. No, it's fine. Uh, I was just going to say, people will talk about Russell Group Universities, you know, medicine at Oxbridge and things like that. At the end of the day, anywhere you go to, to, to do medicine is fantastic and you will get a medical degree at the end of it. So mm -hmm. I know it's quite stressful in terms of, you know, this medical school and that medical scheme is amazing. But if you get a place for medicine, it doesn't matter. You will be a doctor. So don't forget that and don't stress yourself out too much about, obviously apply for the best school you can apply to. Uh, but at the same time, just remember doing medicine itself is an incredible achievement. So don't ever like doubt yourself on that. And just a final point, I guess. Um, I don't think like medicine itself is hard. I think the workload is a lot bigger than you'd have it at um, say A levels or AS level. So I got myself into a state thinking, oh my goodness, medicine's like the most challenging degree. But in fact, like it's only the workload that makes it challenging and like the content is really easy. So yeah, that's my one thing I would love to know. Does anyone want to answer? If not, we can get started with our welcome statement. Okay, let's get started then. All right, so into med school. Who are we and what do we do? Basically, we are more than 2,500 mentors from all over the UK, and we are all medical students. And we offer free mentoring sessions to disadvantaged year 12 and year 13 prospective students. We do so by offering one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, as I've mentioned, online webinar and conferences like these, as well as many educational resources, which can prepare you guys for your medical school application. And you can find that by going on to our website, www.intomedschool.com, with the two being written as a number. You will see there that we have a particular criteria for um, assigning you guys to a mentor and um, kids that go to private schools or do not fall under that criteria, um, which is uh, outlined onto the website. And I won't get into that because it's quite a long one. Unfortunately, do not qualify for our one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions, but we take pride in having in having all of the events that we do free um, and giving out for free all of the educational resources that we have on our website. So not qualifying for the mentoring scheme doesn't mean that you can't be part of our community and that you can't get help with our, um, yeah, with your medical application. Um, last thing I have to say is that I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. We have the Medical Protection Service, the Medical Defense Union, MDU, and Medify. Medify has been particularly amazing because they've offered a £150 UCAS course as a giveaway to everyone or like to someone that fills our pre-conference form and the two post-conference forms. So if you fill those, you will be asked if you want to enter the Medify giveaway and then one name will be chosen or um, will be randomly selected through a, through a generator online for you guys to have um, this free Medify course, uh, which I hear is very, very useful and amazing. So next slide. Okay, so as you guys know, we have a webinar etiquette. Uh, if you've come to previous events or yesterday, you know that this is something that we um, 
always remind you guys of. So please use the Q&A function appropriately. We've disabled the YouTube chat because you guys are minors. So we don't want anything inappropriate to be said. Send your questions on Slido. We've moved away from Mentimeters, but we always forget to upload this slide, to update this slide. Sorry about that. Um, inappropriate questions will not be addressed. So please be professional and kind to us. Um, as this is our Sunday and we've chosen to spend it with you guys. Um, and under inappropriate questions come spammed questions. So if I see you've sent your question more than twice, then it's gonna be the end, okay? Send your questions throughout the webinar and there will be a Q&A session at the end of each talk, as well as a general Q&A at the end of the day in case we haven't answered any particularly important questions. As you know, this is live on YouTube. It will stay on our channel, so you can watch it through the same link. Um, and it will also be on our website, like all of our other webinars. Um, as we've done yesterday, a certificate of attendance will be sent out to everybody that completes the post-webinar evaluation form, in this case, the post-conference evaluation form. Um, we wanted to give you two disclaimers, guys, um, that the view that we express today is today and the views that have been expressed throughout the webinars are the speakers views and they are entirely their own opinion and accounts of their personal experiences these do not represent the voice or of any particular university of UCAS or of an admission panel of a university and do not re re necessarily reflect necessarily reflect on the role official policy or position that intermed school holds so basically all of these words to tell you that what we say today is our personal experience and our own opinion. And that's why sometimes when you ask us difficult questions, then we prefer not giving you an answer simply because we don't know and we don't want to give you a false answer. OK, we don't want to be misleading. And then that into med school has no affiliation to any university. We all go to different universities and we can only really answer it to you about the experience that we've had in our personal uh, life, as we said. So if you have any questions regarding this, please get in touch and we'll explain more. Next slide, please. Okay, so as you guys know, we've all been using this Lido into a mass conference 2021 to ask your questions of the day. Please do not spam. Next up. Okay. So we have the admission test, the BMAT part, which is going to be delivered by my dear friend, Rihan. He is um, a genius, but we are going to have a short break um, just because we said we would get started at 10 and we want to give everybody the time um, to come. So please um, be advised that the break times that we give you guys are just for your own um, for your own benefit, for you to you know, go to the loo or have a break, stretch your legs, um, get a cup of tea. Generally, during these breaks, we do answer some questions, just not to make you guys wait around. However, you do not have to listen to these answers if you, you know, you're not interested and you want to go take a break. Okay, perfect. So should we answer some questions? Cool. So what should I do if I didn't do well for BMAT UCAT? Mm, that's coming later during the day, but thank you for your questions. How much time is lecture slash clinical placement and tutorials versus self-study at medical school? Well, I guess that really depends on the medical school you go to and on yourself, because many people decide that they don't want to study all day long and um, not do any social activities or extracurricular activities. I can only answer for the time we spend in lectures in my own medical school and we go daily from nine to four with one hour lunch break. Um, what's the hardest thing about applying to medicine? Well, I think for me, it was about applying strategically because I did the whole application process by myself and nobody, um, I didn't know anybody that was studying medicine in England. I didn't know nobody that was going to uni in England. So I didn't know there was such a thing as um, schools making a decision on the basis of the UCAT 
uh, score that you add. So I just applied to the schools that I liked more. And by doing so, I actually um, cut my own chances of being successful because if I knew that I would have had more chances to get into one particular school with my UCAT score, I would have, I guess, been more successful. But at the end of the day, I'm studying medicine and I got in the first time around, so I can't complain. Does anyone else want to say what's been the most challenging for them? I think, I think just to echo you and what was mentioned earlier, like medicine is medicine. So like, regardless where you go, you're studying medicine, you will get like a GMC certificate. And that's the most important thing. Um, for me, and for most people, it's the admissions test, uh, mainly because medical students always present in like one way, you have good GCSEs, you have good A levels predictions. The only way um, medical schools can differentiate are via these admission tests. And they are the worst things you'll ever have to do, I think, because they are so bad. But like, maybe someone else will disagree with me. But for me, it was definitely the admission test. I think what you need to remember is that, okay, the admission test is just another hurdle that you need to overcome and you shouldn't fear or worry about, oh no, this is going to be the worst thing ever because X people said it was hard and they said this and they said that. You've got to go in with the mindset that you've done enough preparation to do well. And the best thing about these tests is the sheer number of resources that are available to develop your understanding of what the assessment is like and then how to do better in it. So there's just so much out there that you can do. And the sort of earlier you start, ideally around the summer, the more you work on it, the better you will do. It's all about just, you know, trying your best with these tests and just accepting, you know, this is another hurdle to overcome. However, this, I think the BMAT and even the UCAT are your good first sort of introductory test into trying to cope with firstly the workload of medical school, understanding the content and applying it in, in, in exams effectively. So the, these admission tests are just a little insight into what, you know, a specific topic a medical school will be like. So if you are struggling a lot with this, then potentially, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone, but maybe, you know, you'll struggle even more with the actual medical school. But don't worry, honestly, these tests are for, designed, you know, for you to do well in. They're designed to see what you know. You don't, can't know everything. Um, but just go with it. Just be confident and have a good mindset going into it and you'll be completely fine. I think I'll echo what Rayhan said. Like, it's all very personal because I think everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. Like, for me, I think my hardest section was probably actually doing the interviews for graduate entry because you have no idea what to expect and if you don't know anyone who's done any before then you can't get the advice for it um so I'd say the best thing I wish I kind of knew before going into med school is literally have the confidence to just message someone on social media and be like hi I see that you're a graduate entry student or this student at this university can I get some interview advice from you because if you have no one that is the advice I give to everyone now because I wish I had done that um it's just something as literally starting up a LinkedIn and like searching for medical students at x university and obviously you've got something like into med school now which for a lot of you that would be really helpful if you perhaps don't have a regional um, group of students that are close to you then you can just apply to any uni that has a student there and guaranteed even if it's you know not your choice and say you get like a I don't know, let's just say like an imperial bar student and perhaps you want to go to Holt York then there's someone there to get advice from anyway because we're all really very connected so yeah that's my advice anyway. No thank you all it sounds really really great I guess I wanted to do something that we actually forgot to do yesterday, um, which is introduce ourselves so you know who you're getting your advice from. <laughs> um, I'll start to break the ice. My name is Anna. I am a third year medical student at Anglo-Raskin Medical School, and I'm also one of the events coordinators for Into Med School, which means that, um, yeah, I organize together with the events team all of the events that you guys have been coming to from BMAT prep courses, the interview courses, the a day in the life of a GP, disability in medicine, and much more. And I'm also the co-lead at Anglo-Raskin Medical School for Into Med School, which means I take care of like matching 
the people in my region, the mentees in my region to the mentors in my medical school. And who wants to go next? Um, hi, I'm Charms. I'm a second year medical student at Cardiff University. Um, I'm the other events coordinator in Intermed School. So I work alongside Anna and Thea, who's our other events coordinator, as well as the rest of the team to organize these events for you. So I hope you guys do enjoy it and it's very useful for all of you as well. Um, I'm also the regional head for Cardiff. And currently um, I work with my co-lead. So we cover all of the mentees and students across Wales. Um, and we basically try our best to match every single mentee up to our mentors uh, from Cardiff University. And yeah. Cool. Hi, I'm Lee. Um, I'm a first year medical student at Imperial College London. Um, in Intermed School, I'm also um, a regional head. So like Shan and Anna, I uh, contact and help match um, medical students within the West London region to a, a mentor. And I also help run the mentoring scheme alongside the team. Um, I'll go next. Um, uh, my name is Mayuri. I'm the social media lead for Intermed School and I'm also the regional co-lead for East London alongside Andrew and I'm a third year medical student at Barts in the London at Queen Mary. I'll pass it over to Rahan. Okay, thank you. Hi, so I'm Rahan. I am, as the slide says, a second year medical student at Newcastle University. Um, for Intermed School, I'm one of the teaching education officers. She'll probably be bombarded by emails with me, you know, in the future. Um, but I help to design the resources and put the stuff on the website. And I'm also the co-lead for Newcastle University. So again, just doing the similar things as the people said with matching mentors and mentees together. Um, I'll quickly pass over to Gabriella, I think, and then we'll start, yeah? Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm Gabriella. I'm the vice president for Intermed School. Uh, I'm also a bit of a webmaster. I'm regional head for Warwick and it's really great to have you here and to be answering your questions. I'm doing graduate medicine. So originally I did biomedical science at St. George's in London and now I'm doing medicine at Warwick. Um, so yeah, that's for me. I think Adrian's also on the call. Uh, if Adrian, you want to do a quick introduction and yeah. then we'll yeah. get started with Rayhan. Yeah, I'll pass that to uh, Rayhan in a minute. So very quickly, so my name is Adrian. I'm also one of the teaching and education uh, officers along with Rayhan and Alicia Med School. Uh, I've actually already graduated, so I'm, I'm currently working as a second year foundation doctor in Bedfordshire. And uh, I did UCL, so I was UCL for both my undergraduate degree in physiology as well as medical school. Over to you, Rehan. Thank you very much, Adrian. Right, great. So I think we'll get started now then, yeah? Okay, so before we uh, get right into it, so um, I'm going to be talking about BMAT. Just a quick sort of disclaimer, this is relevant to both my talk on the BMAT and Adrian's talk on UCAT in a bit. So we are going to be giving you an overview of what BMAT and UCAT is. We're going to talk about the structure, the timing and relevant information, and then signposting you to necessary resources, how best to prepare and what top tips and advice that we have. However, what this session is not is a specific detailed insight into either of the admission tests. Neither will we be doing practice questions. We will show you some questions, but we're not gonna talk through the sort of exam questions. Um, we'll give you some tips, but not sort of, you know, the in-depth detailed analysis of what to do well in each section only because all of these will be done at future events held by Intermed School, you know, where we've got more time. This is just a quick overview. Next slide, please. So let's start off with BMAT. Um, on the right-hand side, I've got the list of the universities that are BMAT, okay? So not all of them are BMAT, obviously. So if you want to play any of those universities, you need to do the BMAT test, which is the Biomedical Admissions Test. There's three sections in the BMAT. We've got the first section, which is Thinking Skills, second section is science and math and the third section is the essay people find every section challenging in different ways some people find one section better than the other some people hate the math some people hate the essay but it's all about finding you know the medium that you like and then even if you don't like a certain part it's working on those areas 
Next slide, please. So starting off with section one on thinking skills. As a quick overview, there's 32 questions and you've got about 60 minutes to answer it. So you do have some time. Um, you don't get marks deducted for incorrect answers. So there's no reason for you to not at least guess every answer. Generally, the thinking skills section is all based around problem solving. So you will be using your numerical skills and sort of logical skills to produce reasoning using graphs and diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. And there's also critical thinking that's applied to that. So using reasoning with everyday language from a, a qualitative perspective. And each question's got five options for you to pick from. And again, as I said, there's no reason why you should not be answering every question. Next slide, please. Okay, so just more on the first section. There, this section is difficult because there is no sort of fixed syllabus or curriculum for you to sit down and go, right, I'm going to study this aspect and study that aspect because it's all just sort of logical thinking and reasoning. Okay, so there's no fixed syllabus. However, you can revise this section by doing constant practice questions on it. It's a good idea to be quick at your mental maths on here. Um, they won't ask you anything too challenging. And this is important for this section and the section after because there's no calculators. You need to be able, you need to be comfortable with converting. So know your orders of magnitude and your powers and so on, um, your units of conversion, um, decimal point standard form, knowing all of that and how to convert sort of seamlessly between them make it so much easier to do well. Don't feel intimidated by the amount of data given to you, okay? There's this sort of like constant need in these BMAT exams to push so much information at you and it can become very overwhelming. And that's kind of relevant of medical school really. And it's about sifting through what they give you and going, right, what's the most sort of pertinent thing from here that I can apply and then use my own knowledge and sort of work through the reasoning to work out the answer. So as I said before, there's elements of problem solving and critical thinking. So for the critical thinking based questions, um, it just is to read sort of long passages that they give you and then try and answer the question. So again, use the passage, inference, read between the lines. And then for problem solving, again, it's a good idea to look through the options they give you and then look at the data. So, you know, if there's a general commonality you can see with the options, i.e. they're all, you know, they all end in zero or something, then you know where you need to be aiming your answer, where you need to be pitching something. And then you can just sort of make an educated guess. This is especially true for questions that are generally quite difficult. And you just need to guess at or make an educated guess, really. Just look through the answers, sift through what they're given, and you can work that out. And this is quite similar to the verbal reasoning section in the UCAT, which Adrian will talk about. So here's an example question. So I'm not going to go through this. Um, so you will be given these resources after. So there'll be more questions throughout. So feel free to read this, but this is just for you um, to understand. Okay, next slide, please. So in terms of what you need to do over the summer and how to best prepare. So the summer really is the best time to start studying for this. Um, there's a section one guide that's been released um, from Cambridge, which designed the exam. So it's a good idea to read through that familiarize yourself with the style of questions and then sort of create a timetable for revision. So just think I'm gonna do 10 to 15 questions of this style every day and then start doing actual tests and practice papers and so on. And we've got tons of practice papers from 2003 that you can use and it's a good idea to do them under time conditions. Next slide, please. Okay. Right, so in terms of the official guidelines, this is again being sort of extrapolated from that booklet. So I'm not going to spend too long going through this because I'm conscious about time, but feel free to read the actual guide. I have linked the guide somewhere. Um, but again, as I said before, you'll have all these resources available to you. Um, a point to note is that from September 2020, 2020, section one sort of contains less of the data analysis -y stuff. Um, but again, you can read the specifications to understand what, what that means. Next slide, please. OK, so here are some resources that are sort of integral that I use for my preparation. So things like Blackstone Tutors, Physics and Maths Tutor. Again, so much stuff on um, YouTube. The TSA Oxford papers are good to practice section one, and so are the OCR A-level critical thinking papers. Um, the OCR papers are a bit on the easier side, but it's a good idea to sort of practice with them at the start just to get to grips with what you need to do and challenge your brain in that particular way. And then, of course, Medify is a fantastic resource that you can use. Next slide, please. So we're going to move on to the second section, which is the science and math section. Personally, this was my favorite section. However, I am a bit of a nerd, so I do like this. I do like all the science and math stuff. Um, personally, I think this is the section where you can most maximize your marks because you have an idea of what will be assessed because there is a syllabus effectively. You've got 
sort of the knowledge base and the curricula so you know what to revise. Um, however, this is, does have the least number of questions. This has got 27, probably because they know people can revise that really. And I guess the most important thing about this section is that it's not necessarily that much of a test of knowledge, rather it's more of a test of application. So you've got to have the correct knowledge base. However, the most important thing is, can you apply the knowledge of biology, chemistry, physics, and maths to relatively demanding questions? The level, they say it's sort of at GCSE, but it's not really. It's kind of above GCSE, but a bit below year 12. It's in this sort of weird intermediate there. And generally, most people doing the BMAT will have biology and chemistry, occasionally math, and a lot of people won't have physics. So it is a good idea to begin your preparation with physics. Um, but yeah, so again, as I said before, it's all about application of knowledge in this section. Next slide, please. So as I said, it's not about recall, rather it's about application and you need to, of course, memorize the facts, memorize the content, but apply that to novel, challenging scenarios and contexts that are generally unusual, um, that you haven't met before. But again, it's all about using your logical reasoning, think about what you do know, and then apply that. And then often, again, like I said, if you're unsure, make an educated guess, look at the answers given and see what you can do. Next slide, please. So again, another checklist I've made for you in terms of what to do is firstly, read over the BMAT section two guide as there was with section one, read over the specification, okay? And the good thing is the first thing I did is I printed out the specification, I went through all the topics and I just rated like um, the smiley face, a, a sad face and a you know average face, I guess, how I felt on each part. Um, and then the things that I just didn't get as in the sad face, I had to revise them first. So over some, I made a revision time label in um, sort of an Excel spreadsheet looking at what parts you could do first. And again, a lot of people will have not done physics since GCSE. So it is a good idea to start with the physics first, okay? And there's so many resources online that you can use for the physics. You've got things like your old textbooks, use them again. You've got um, all the resources listed before, and I'll give you some more. You've got YouTube videos, you've got GCSE papers. So use all of them and then eventually practice with the BMAP papers. Next slide, please. So again, here's another screenshot of just the official guidance. Um, so again, feel free to read this in your own time, but it's just sort of echoing what I talked about before. Next slide. So the resources, going back to this, um, what helped me a lot with this section particularly was number three, which was the BMAP Pass Paper Work Solutions. So effectively, this is a big book which goes through every single BMAP question from all the different papers um, that have happened before. And it gives you the answer and a work solution because the mark schemes for BMAT generally just give you, you know, is it was it A or was it C or was it D? And sometimes, you know, you don't know why it's that option. So this was such a good book um, to have. So I definitely, you know, recommend getting that. And a lot of these, I think Adrian will talk about later, you can find for free online. So that book was really, really good. And so was the um, IS, um, the ISC book as well. And again, you've got things like physics and math tutor, YouTube, and again, Medify. Next slide, please. So I've put an example of a physics question. So again, physics, you, everyone hates physics. Can't relate, I love physics, but again, I'm weird. But these are the kind of stuff they'll be asking you. So for this question particularly, we're not gonna go too much into it, but you need to have a knowledge base of what resistors are, you need to know the equations, and then you need to understand how resistance changes in parallel and series circuits, and then apply that using maths. And do all of that very quickly without a calculator. So it is demanding, however, just, try and use reasoning and just look through like i can already see the numbers are quite simple so it won't take too much time um and sometimes you know you'll see a question if you're thinking that looks really hard just don't do that for now do an easier one and then come back to it next question okay so now we're going to move on to the essay now the essay is a part people really really hate i again i really like the essay my part i hated really was the first section. I really like the second and the third section, but the essay, we're using the term essay loosely here, it's not really an essay, rather it's an extended piece of writing. Um, and it's effectively covering a side of A4 paper or 550 words in a word processor, um, if you were to type it. You get a choice of three essay titles and you pick one, obviously, please do not do more than one. I know people who have done more than one and it does not work out well for you. So please don't do more than one. Um, what they sort of give you is a statement which is scientific um, slash medical, but sometimes it can be a bit philosophical. And generally, the idea is to craft an essay, but it's more about showing your individual style with that essay. 
um, and we'll look at how to actually do the essay in a second. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, here I've basically done a brief outline of how they want you to craft the essay. And I think this is the best way. So I did well in my essay, I got the highest mark possible, which was like a 5A. Um, and this is basically what I did for anything, whenever I did anything. So in terms of when I was preparing, I used to just write lots and lots of um, practice answers and so on. So in terms of how to craft the essay, there's three things you need to do generally. You need to firstly explain the item proposed. So by that, I mean, whatever statement they give you, you need to look at that and sort of dissect what they're on about. You need to then produce a counter argument, okay? So you've got to have four arguments and then against arguments. So then look at the opposite side of that argument. So if the sentence was, I don't know, all doctors have a um, duty to be researchers as well as medical professionals, well, you might think, yes, that's good. However, on the other hand, no, this isn't whatever, you know, whatever your counter argument is. And then finally, you've got to find a medium between the two sides and reconcile both of them offering a solution. So you bring the for and against arguments together. And throughout the essay, it's important that you use your own judgment and opinion to answer the questions. Okay, next slide, please. So another checklist over the summer is firstly, you need to know what the baseline of an essay is. And that seems like an introduction, a body of conclusion. And the most pertinent thing with an essay is having one constant line of argument running through. What I mean by line of argument is something that you outline. So your one key point that you're making in this whole thing, you outline in your introduction and you bring that through each of your points, okay? So whatever your key specific point is, you've got to bring that through your essay and get used to crafting that into your writing. It's a good idea to plan for a range of different titles or just draw for and against tables or pros and cons, whatever you want to call the positive and negative statements. And then the most important thing here is not necessarily... Um, the time that you have, because you've got quite a bit of time, but rather it's the amount, and it's very easy to write a lot without saying anything, because you have to only write, you know, on one side of A4, you've got to make every sentence count, and it's got to be specific and concise and well-written, so it's all about the quality rather than the quantity here. Next slide, please. So again, I've just added um, more from the official guidance, so you can feel free to sort of read through um, this. I think the last line is quite good. Do not feel obliged to answer the medical questions because you start medicine. Again, it's true if you like the more philosophical or ethics sounding question, go for it. OK, and the best way to prepare for these is by just doing a bit of wider research and so on, just reading some books to help you. Next slide. Yep. Yeah. And again, just um, I've got some more screenshots here so we can um, go through this. So next slide. Sorry, I mean, you can go through this. And again, just another question. Right. So to in terms of resources, previous BMAT papers, very obviously. BMAT Samples, Essay and Guides is a really good book as well because it gives you sample essays. Blacks on Tuesday is fantastic. And then again, like I said, the OCR A Level Critical Thinking Papers um, is quite good because that actually has an essay question in it. Um, so it's just giving you more exposure to different kinds of statements. And, you know, sometimes just write a statement yourself and think, what could I possibly, you know, explore here? Because they will try to bring, you know, clever and creative statements. So just try and think outside the box sometimes, but don't worry too much. Sometimes it'll just be a nice, easy statement. You don't have to pick the most complicated sounding statement. You can pick the simplest statement and then still do really, really well. Next question. Sorry, next slide. So here I have, um, again, a screenshot, like I was saying about what it's like. So life is a natural and doctors and care, other, others caring for a patient need to recognise that the point may come in the progression of patient condition where death is drawing near. So this is a very sort of a medical in terms of actually practice, practicing as a doctor and that's come straight from good medical practice. Um, so these are the kind of sort of ways in which they'll present the question and you've got to you know, ex sort of explore what that means. Um, and like I said, offer a counter argument, reconcile the two and have your line of argument running through. Next slide, please. Okay, so great, that's it for me. I'm now gonna pass over um, to Dr. Adrian and then she will carry on with the youth portion, but thank you very much for listening. We'll do a Q&A at the end. Hi, Rayanne, thanks very much. Hello, good morning to everyone listening in. Thanks very much for hanging in there and still being with us. So I'm just going to take you through the uh, U campus. So you've heard from Rehan about the BMAT and the UCAT is um, generally speaking the second um, admission test that gets used uh, by universities um, in the medical selection process. If I can, next slide please, thank you. So again, very quick overview really, um, when I've also provided you with some sample questions, but we're not going to be looking at these in too much detail. Um, 
just to introduce you to the UCAT a little bit, it is a um, two hour computer based exam assessing a range of mental abilities. That's literally the quote from UCAT from their official website. And it's often dubbed psychometric testing because it's got sort of a range of different ways of thinking um, that it assesses. It, it basically, it's a, it's a cognitive test. So unlike the BMAT, where there is some bits that you can actually have a syllabus to prepare from, the UCAT doesn't really have that. Um, I'm going to very quickly point out that there is the UCAT SEN, which is the extended version of the exam. So if there is anyone who needs to apply for uh, extended time because of whatever medical conditions, disabilities, anything like that, there is an extended version of the exam available to be sat um, and can be applied for. Both the UCAT and the UCAT SEN, so the only difference being between the two exams is the amount of time you have for it, but both will assess the, these five areas, so your verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, abstract uh, reasoning, decision making, situational judgment. And we'll look at these in a little bit more detail in a minute. So which medical schools are required that you get? As you can see, quite a few of them. So, so unis will generally be dubbed either BMAT universities or UCAT universities. So it's one or the other that you will be having to sit for uh, for the admission process. And, and UCAT is still the one that gets used um, a lot more widely, much, more, much um, more of the universities use UCAT than the BMAT. But I will say for this slide, please, 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 before you apply, do check because this information is sort of correct when I made the slide two weeks ago, but it may well change. So please do keep keep an eye on things, do check with the uh, website, on the website of the university, just to make sure that, that they haven't changed because sometimes they do. So on the next slide we have, um, do I have to set the UCAT? Well, like I said, it's either the UCAT or the BMAT. Most students, I would say, probably said both because they apply to both UCAT universities and BMAT universities. But you can choose to sit only the one, and, and this would be, generally speaking, if you only sit the one, it would be the UCAT. Because, like I said, the BMAT gets used by far fewer universities, you'd probably be very limited on your options if you only did the BMAT. Um, like I say, sometimes universities switch from one to the other, so please, please, please do, do make sure we usually buy sort of summertime they have it finalized which one they're going to be going with for that particular admission cycle and also sometimes you might run into this issue of a university using both now that's going to be using one of them for the undergraduate entry and one of them for the graduate entry and sometimes they use different ones so make sure if you're obviously most of you will be undergraduate just make sure you know which one they use for undergraduate entry and maybe some of you in the audience are uh, graduate entry medics so again make sure that it might be a different one that they use for the graduate entry so just to, to be aware of that. So the UCAT timeline again this is from from their very own website please 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 do make note of these deadlines. Um, I will say that um, it, like Rayan said having having a timeline set up and sort of planned out, please do add in these days because you don't want to miss them. Unfortunately, if you miss the deadlines, there is just simply nothing that really can be done about that. So uh, at the top, I've just pointed out that there is, um, when the application opens up, there is a bursary application option because the UCAT does cost 75 pounds to sit, but you may be eligible to sit it for free. So definitely worth having a look at the um, bursary application bit. And, and, and do be mindful of, of all of these deadlines. And another thing that I've pointed out on this slide is that with the UCAT, you will know your results literally, I think, like on the day when you sit it. Where, whereas the BMAT, you won't actually know the result until after you've submitted your application. So the UCAS deadline, as you heard in talks yesterday, is the 15th of October, I believe, or sort of halfway through October. And you will sit the UCAT before then, you have to. There is a range of dates that you can sit, sit it on, but generally speaking, the last day is usually at the very beginning of October, whereas the BMAT you will be sitting after the deadline, which is actually really useful because with the UCAT, you can be very, very strategic. And there's actually a really good section on Medic Portal that 
sort of breaks down and advises you where to apply depending on how you scored with the UCAT. So there's tons and tons of information out there. So if you feel like it didn't go particularly well on the day or you feel like your score isn't that great, there's still loads of options available to you. Again, it's just be a question of being a little bit strategic with that. So next slide. Um, again, coming up, just a very brief overview of the UCAT subtest, so the five subtests that we mentioned. Um, these questions are there as an example. They will not be discussed in further detail because, like we said, we'll have loads of events coming up with uh, Internet School that we'll be looking at that in more detail in workshops as well. Um, so the first, first section, um, verbal reasoning. You have 44 questions. Note by questions, so I've put in the bottom, you have four questions for each of 11 tests. So 44 questions doesn't mean... 44 texts and questions, it means that you will have 11 texts to read through and each of them will have four questions associated. And um, you will have, uh, like you can see, I've put across the top the little banner, on average about, um, you, you'll have, sorry, one minute reading time uh, and 21 minutes test time. So that means that you have one minute to read through and then you have 44 questions to answer in 21 minutes each question being worth one mark. And you have a range of scores going from 300 to 900. So basically when people talk about um, their average score in for the UCAT, they talk about a value somewhere between 300 and 900. And that's basically to say how much they average per section. So that's verbal reasoning. And like you say, like you can see text, and then either it's gonna be true or false or pick one of four statements. Sorry, thanks, next slide. Your next uh, type of question is your quantitative reasoning. So this is your MAPSI bit. Here you're going to have, um, as you can see again from the banner, you've got 36 questions. You will have one minute reading time and 24 minute test time in the standard UCAT. Again, you've got uh, each of your questions worth one mark. And like you can see, you've got four or five options that you're going to have to be best out of. No negative marking. So please, please, please always submit an answer for each of these sections. And again, you have basically stems and you have multiple questions associated with, with each step. Next one, uh, abstract reasoning. So this is a bit of a, a bit of an odd one. You've got um, 55 questions that you're going to have um, uh, 13 minutes to answer. So it's a bit fast and furious. And this is basically to do with pattern recognition. You get a set A of shapes and a set B of shapes. So that's the stem of your questions. And then you get this test shape. And the question is, does this test shape fit into set A, set B, or neither? And there are certain rules um, that, again, um, through practice and through attending some of our later events, you will come to learn in terms of what are, what are the things that you're looking for, number of edges, number of angles, shading, number of figures, and things like that. So there is a very um, quick set of rules that you can look through and decide whether it's A or B or neither. And again, if, if you're not sure, please just have a guess because there is no negative marking. The next section is decision making. So this is um, this is a section that says um, to you that there is a scenario. Um, there is going to be again three or four questions per stem, twenty nine questions total in thirty one minutes. So there is going to be a statement, and based on that, you have to decide whether a certain sort of um, a certain claim is false or true, or you have to decide which is the most appropriate statement to make depending on what the stem of the question said. So that's your uh, decision making bit. And finally, we get onto the situational judgment, uh, which is probably sort of a little bit, uh, a little bit of an odd one out. And this uh, was actually recently reintroduced into the UCAP. And the situational judgment basically tests how well you can respond to a certain situation, a certain scenario, and decide what is a good course of action to take or a bad course of action to take. You're going to have 69 questions in total to answer in 26 minutes. And generally speaking, like you can see from this example, you will have the situation as described, and then you will have to decide 
that a certain reaction, a certain action to take is then very appropriate, appropriate, inappropriate, or very inappropriate. And unlike the rest of the four sections in the situational, in, sorry, in the UCAT, you don't have a score of ranging from 300 to 900. Instead, what happens is that your score gets looked at and you get slotted into band one, two, three, or four. So basically like quartiles. And if you score in band one, that's sort of you're in the top 25%, you've been, done really, really well. And then the second band is your bit sort of between sort of the median, so 50% to 75%, band three is 25 to 50, and then band four is sort of your zero to 25. So ideally you want to be scoring in like band one or two, so that that's, if you will, what constitutes a good score for uh, the situational judgment. Okay, so uh, next slide. So basically, I th probably that's a little bit shocking. You can see that it's quite limited on time. It's a bit of a fast and furious exam, but we have tons and tons of resources. We're going to be running loads of events. You're going to have your mentors. So we're really here to help you prep for this and, and succeed and do as well as possible and score as high, highly as possible. So please, 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 please don't panic. We are here to help you with it. So in terms of the resources, um, all of these websites, if you look through, they, they are free. So we've got uh, obviously links with Medify, who are a fantastic resource. Um, put up sort of your UCAT YouTube channel, which is really uh, helpful in talking through you through the various bits of the UCAT. Um, you've got um, the official UCAT websites, which I would really, really recommend. You've got your official UCAT practice papers. So these are these are links to really the only existing official past papers out there. So there's tons of resources. I have included a, a few books here if you're interested or if you have access to these through your school libraries or uh, through various forums. If you know people who've used them in the past and sort of um, are looking to pass them on. And you also do have certain free online services such as Z Library and LibGen as well. But do not feel obliged to buy any resources. This is sort of just my personal experience and my personal opinion on what can constitute to um, for um, fairly useful resources. But the vast majority of resources out there available for free is really excellent and definitely sufficient to help you to get prepared well. Um, in terms of the um, situational judgment, so section five, I do really want to point out again, like I, I did in my talk yesterday as well, GMC good medical practice and then the GMP, so the good medical practice in action scenarios, case studies, because really this is the sort of thing that they'll be looking at and, and it sort of overlaps with that whole professional behavior, integrity, candor, honesty. So a lot of the soft skills that you would need for medicine, that's kind of what the situational judgment is trying to tease out. And I would say probably these are your best resources to look at. And the case studies are pretty fun. Uh, pre-interactive, they don't take up their sort of a few minutes long each, but it really gets you into that mindset of how to how to conduct yourself. And I I would say that that's something that's going to be a recurring theme throughout medical school and also throughout your medical career. So leaning up to the exam, um, just to reiterate what Rehan already said, so making a schedule, putting in all the really salient deadlines, I would say. Um, Setting up um, UCAT, uh, sort of your revision schedule for UCAT and the BMAT if you're sitting both of them, getting that work experience sorted for the summer, volunteering research and um, medical um, research into medical schools, additional projects merit. So basically, all of the stuff that you've already got going on the during the summer is already looking like a really really busy summer. But please do start with the UCAT and the BMAT revision <clears throat> on time. Read the official UCAT guidance, really, really important. Book your exam date, preferably um, book sooner rather than later. Um, pick a date, so you, with the UCAT, you can choose the date when you sit the exam, whereas the BMAT is just one uniform date for everybody. So again, have a think when you would like to do the UCAT and ideally pick that date fairly early on and then start preparing a good two, three months ahead of the exam at least, I would say, because it's it's something that takes a bit of time to build up to, to get to know the um, 
mindset of the exam, if you will, and just doing volumes and volumes of questions is, is, is always the way to go. Um, get to know the uh, subsections, absolutely. And yes, build up that pattern recognition, use the past papers, they're out there. And definitely in, Intermediate Med School will be running uh, workshops on the UCAT and discussing those specific strategies for each of the different subsections. So do recommend uh, attending our events as well later on in the year. So I think that's everything from me. Um, Rehan, I don't know if you had anything to add still at this point. I know, I think you've uh, echoed everything well, but as we, you know, we've just sort of said throughout both the talks, it's not, don't worry too much about these. They are demanding exams, but they are designed to be demanding. The point of these is to, you know, sift through all the applicants. And this is ultimately the most sort of like quantitative measure that the unis have in terms of filtering out everyone. Or, you know, things go very well sometimes on the day, things don't go that well. And then we've got a series, you know, a plethora of so many more talks and so on, looking at how to, to maximise your marks. What happens if things don't go well? What happens if they do go really well, you know? But the point is not to stress too much about these, okay? You've got so much preparation available and just to go in to these exams and just be confident and know that, you know, whatever you do, whatever you put forward, what happens, happens. And whether you do amazingly, whether you do averagely, whether you do poorly, it's okay. There's so many more ways um, to get into medicine. There's so many ways to get better at this, you know, and if it doesn't work the first time, try the next time. I know somebody who has uh, tried to get into medicine 10 times. So he's been persistent and he got in at the end. Whether, you know, it's a wise decision for him to try 10 times, what mm -hmm. that happens like to get is his persistence. But, you know, so many applicants will not get in the first time and that's okay you know it does take time um you know and it's, it's fine you just gotta find a balance and just work through these and work on what you were struggling with and if you are passionate about being a doctor you will become a doctor you know if you want to say anything else adrian or no i i agree i think we, just echoing what you said we all know people who literally um tried tried and tried and tried and finally got in 10 is quite extreme the person i knew who tried the most probably was about five mm. but we all know there's i'm working with someone at the moment who literally he ran his own business for 30 years and then sort of decided to become a doctor in his 50s so went through medical school mm. in his 50s and now is a doctor and mm. you, you know people take weird and wonderful paths and i think uh, definitely when I was like 17, 18, thinking about applying to medical school for the first time, I didn't like really appreciate probably just how long, like the whole process of, you know, train, like even when you become a doctor is still training and still applying for training programs and so on. So they're basically what I'm just trying to say, there is no rush. Um, and I think uh, sort of being quite young, you always have that drive of like, you know, what's the next thing and I have to get to it. And it's, and, and it feels like a really precious sort of environment and you've got loads of exams and you're juggling loads, but really there is no rush. So just, you know, get, like I said yesterday, be kind to yourself, do things, you know, do I want a bit of time out? Do I want to take a breather? It's perfectly fine to do that. People do that, they go on career breaks all the time. Um, I'm Like I said, I'm, a, you know, I'm in my second year of foundation and most people don't go straight into uh, specialty training. And again, this is sort of something you don't have to worry about, but I'm just trying to use it as a point to illustrate that there is no rush. So, you know, if not next this time, you, you know, hopefully next time. And there's nothing, no, nothing wrong with that. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, just that. And you're always gonna feel this weird identity crisis. You know, do I really belong here? I wake up in the morning and I think, do I belong in medical school? And I, I, I bet Dr. Adrian thinks the same thing. She's on the ward sometimes. You know, should I really be here? Oh, or yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, I think with medicine, especially, you've got to think of the big picture and go in for the right reasons. Don't, you know, people go in for the money. Honestly, I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> you know, you're going in to help people ultimately, you know, and you've got to be passionate about this and just think of the big picture and you're going to have so many exams it does not end it is a minefield but you know what everyone's in that field it's not just you alone and you know we're all we're all just gonna go through that navigate slowly you know we're all everyone's here to support you you know and 
it will all be fine. So don't worry too much about any of this. And like Adrian was saying perfectly, if you want to take a breather, take a breather, you know, put your mental health first, because that is what matters ultimately beyond everything else, beyond the academics, beyond the scores, beyond getting into this and doing that and doing this essay and writing that blog post. What matters more if you're healthy enough to do that? Right, great. So I think we'll pass on to any of the Q&As, Anna. Let's go for it, guys. So thank you so much, as always, for your pills of knowledge. The kids are loving it, literally calling you lifesavers, which is what you are. Um, so first question, since there are so many UCAT and BMAT resources, how do we know which one we should use or which one to choose? I'll start a little bit on that and then I'll pass over to Adrian. So in terms of what to choose, again, it just depends on what works for you. Um, it's kind of a thing like, oh, let's say you're going to the shop and you're like, right, what type of mushroom do I get today? Do I get the chestnut mushrooms? Or do I get the normal ones? You know, you can get as many things as you want, but it doesn't mean it's going to be nice. You've got to just pick what works for you. Try a couple of the resources out. Use some of the resources that people think are, you know, a bit better. For example, a lot of people really like the Medify resources or they like at this particular book um but you might not and it's just about finding what works for you ultimately there are resources that are generally you know better quality um which you should be aiming to use which is what me and adrian have both talked about but if that doesn't work for you there's other resources to go for so i would suggest looking at the things we said and especially for bema looking at the actual papers from you know cambridge if you, they are the best you know thing you could have the UCAT's a bit harder. They do have the official UCAT practice marks. I think we've got three of them and some section questions. So you can look at them as well because they're the, you know, they come straight from the horse's mouth. But ultimately, it's about finding a balance between the two. What do you think, Adrian? Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely say to, to start with, with all, all of the sort of websites that we listed because they're freely available. Have a look at them. Have a look at what people have said. Uh, have a look at how people felt in terms of how well they felt prepped for the exam so it's always a good shout to have a look on forums or sort of re read around a resource and say and see what people who use that resource and then said the exam said about it afterwards did it reflect the exam was it realistic were, were their expectations by that resource met so i would say first have a sort of look around based on sort of the information we gave you in our slides or if you know friends or your school or anyone else who's recommended resources and have a read around, have a look around, see what you like, see what works for you like Rayhan said and see what people who've said the exam have to say about that resource. And I would say that would that should give you a, a good idea. Medify is definitely a really, really good one because they actually, even within the subset, they break down like for example, your uh, quantitative reasoning ones into like your uh, pie question like your pie chart questions or your graph questions or your time and velocity questions so so they're very well honed even within the different subsections to the nuances that do come up so things like that are probably worth paying attention to thank you guys next up we have do you think it's too much work writing both the ucat and the bmat and do you suggest writing both exams Um, so, my, sorry. Do you want to go first, Maria? Oh uh, no, I was going to say you can take this one. So um, I said the beam uh, again. I'm going to give you a very quickly personal insight to this. Uh, I applied to medical school uh, on two separate occasions. I was unsuccessful the first time, and that's why I did uh, biomed first. So I, I said both the UCAT and the BMAT um, twice. <laughs> I just love exams. Um, and what I found is personally for me, I really enjoyed the fact that I was able to spread my options wide and far. The UCAT wasn't an exam that sat well with me. I really didn't like psychometric testing. I didn't get it. I probably didn't prepare as well as I should have. But I found by comparison that the BMAT I was able to work with more because it has more of that syllabus element to it. And usually every year I have a handful of students that I do see through the, the, the process the entire process of applying to medical school. And I would say, if it is an option for you, if you don't find it too taxing, spreading yourself in terms of applying both to UCAT universities and BMAT universities is, can be a really, really good thing. Now, obviously, if you're finding it too much that you know, preparing for two exams is just not for you, 
and you're finding that you're actually running on with the UCAT really well, again, that's absolutely fine. In that case, probably the best strategy for you is just the year with the UCAT. So again, familiarize yourself with both exams, see how well you feel like you'd be able to prepare for just the one or both, and see what works best for you. What do you think, Ryan? I um, definitely agree with that. I think I did both just because I was like, right, I'll maximize my chances as much as possible, really. Um, if it is mentally taxing to do both, which is why some people generally will do the BMAT kind of earlier in the year, because you can do that in, um, in sort of like, rather than it being in um, October, you can do it in August or September. So then you can get that out of the way and then you'll get your results earlier as well. I think that was one of the questions. They were like, oh, if you do it earlier, do you get the results at a different time? You get them, um, whenever you've done them, you get them a couple of weeks after. So you will get, if you do it in, if you do it earlier, you'll get your results first. And then that can help you inform where you're going to apply. So that would be the best thing to do. I didn't do that. I did the BMAT sort of in November when it was the normal time to do it, um, which I guess wasn't that good in hindsight because really I should have waited to get my results. But I think it's a good idea to do both if you think you're able to do both. I know tons of people that just do you can I think the riskiest thing is, per, well, personally speaking, just doing BMAT, if you just do BMAT, because the fact that you don't get your results, just heaven forbid, let's say you just did quite badly, none of the unis will accept you then. Whereas with UCAT, at least, you know, you've got something there, you know, that you can, you've got a base score and you can kind of just pitch where you pick and have a safety net uni effectively because some unis all unis have different criteria and thresholds and cutoffs and you know they all use all these words which all just mean the same thing really it's all about being sort of clever with what you pick really and there's a lot of resources online to help you that so medic portal's got some great sort of articles that they've written on where to really pick um but that's where i go just think i'd start strongly over summer preparing for both if you think you're capable of see how you feel and then kind of make your decision Um, have we got any other questions, Anna? Yeah, we do have another one, uh, which kind of ties in nicely with what you just said. Um, will some unis accept lower BMAT or UCAT scores if you perform well in interviews and have good GCSEs and a good personal statement? Um, again, I think it's just every uni is a bit different in terms of their criteria. If you're applying for Oxbridge unis, I think generally it will be a bit tighter with their applications only because the majority of people applying for those types of unis will generally have stronger grades to back them up. Um, however, there are things like widening participation, you know, flags and so on that will come up and maybe make them, you know, sort of more receptive to giving you an interview. But ultimately, every uni has different criteria um, and it's about picking where you think is best. So I'm at Newcastle University right now and Newcastle is notoriously known for having a very, very high UCAT threshold. I think last year their threshold was something like 710 or 700 um, as the average across the thing. But I picked Newcastle because I did well in my UCAT. So I was like, right, I'll pick a uni that looks at the UCAT quite strongly compared to GCSE grades. Um, even though, you know, both are fine. I was like, I've done well in my UCAT, I might as well just push this one out a bit. But again, it depends. Adrian, you probably have some more knowledge on this, I think. Well, I would, I would say, um, um, like I, I mentioned in my talk as well yesterday, there is the Medic Portal uh, comparison tool, which is really, really good because at any, uh, you put in four different universities and it gives you the full comparison in terms of what, um, uh, and not just the comparison tool, but the uni by uni uh, advice section of, of the medic portal is freely available. And it's really useful because it does tell you specifically whatever information is available in terms of how a particular medical school utilizes the um, UCAS scores, BMAS scores, GCSE A level predictors and all of that, and the personal statement as well, which I mentioned in my talk. So there are going to be variations and do sort of, again, be strategic and do apply where you sort of feel like you've got the best chances. If you've got a really, really high UCAT, go for a high UCAT uni, like I said. If you've got uh, a good BMAT score, um, then also you think that you will be scoring well in the BMAT because that's one that you feel more comfortable with, then absolutely do think about applying for a couple of BMAT unis. If you have a really strong personal statement, then you do want to make sure that that gets considered early on in the process. There are a lot of um, small nuances. There is a lot of variation from uni to uni. So just to reiterate, the medical portal comparison tool, the medical portal uni by uni description of what the requirements of that medical, that particular medical school are, 
the, the university's own website. All of these are really, really helpful in, in helping you make that decision. Just to add to what Adrian's saying, um, I've seen some questions about cut-off scores and whether um, you know you actually get told what the scores are. Some unis are a bit more transparent than others. Um, for example, I think St Andrews flat out say that the bottom two percentiles will not be invited for an interview, whereas some are just a bit more vague with what they're saying. And that's because, well, theoretically, the way they generate a cut-off is they look at everyone applying, they'll look at all their scores, go down a spreadsheet and then find a part where they can just put a line through and go, right, we'll invite the people above this line, we won't invite people below this line, and then anyone kind of on the line will, you know, put us a question mark and see if we have any space or if someone there doesn't do that well or whatever. Whatever complicated, you know, algorithm or mechanism they have to work. Um, it's sadly not just, you know, a spin the wheel and we'll see what score it lands on this year and then we'll have that as the cutoff. Um, but it is based on sort of how the cohort is doing. So as I said before, Newcastle is known to have a high score, but... Newcastle has never gone out and said, yeah, our minimum requirement every year will be 700. That's only because it's a bit of a weird paradoxical situation. Newcastle has a high score because people applying to Newcastle have high scores. So it's kind of like, well, of course they'll have a high score because everyone applying doesn't have a high score because historically it's just been like that. Whereas in um, other unis, for example, like Liverpool will have a cutoff that's more towards the average or a bit less than the average, just because, again, the people applying there will be around that region so it is a bit of a weird territory and no one really knows people will say oh we have inside information about this or we know that but i guess it's just looking at historically what you think will do fine and again medic portal is great for filtering i think we're coming up to time now Rayhan. so what i've said is that i'm more than happy to come back at sort of the two o'clock and ask some more questions about the ucab bima i don't know if Rayhan, you're around but um I think we're going to have to go in a bit of a break soon and then we've got mm -hmm. to talk in 10 minutes. But if, if there are more questions that come up uh, during the day, then I'm definitely happy to come back and, and take those. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening to our talks. And we hope you found them useful. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, yes, let's take a break. And at 11, we will have our second talk of the day about different learning styles in medical school and how to pick a medical school. Meanwhile, there's always our holding slide. You can leave us a Google review. You can fill the pre-conference form if you want to be entered in the Medify giveaway. You can also sign up to be a mentee. And there's all of our Anna, um, social media handles. Yes, please go pre, for it. The, the pre-conference link is actually the post-conference one for yesterday. Oops. Okay. <laughs> so if anyone wants do to not, Don't do that, okay. guys. Um, um, we'll change the holding slide now. Very thank you sorry. for thank you for making us notice when you're no but yes guys um take a break and come back or even leave us run we're not gonna do much um but at 11 we're gonna have our next talk links are in the youtube description by the way um there's the links for the post-conference form uh the google reviews the slido how to sign up to be a mentee um, so you can find all of that on YouTube. Cool. Oh, yeah, Lee suggested a good thing, which is if uh, you go to the website, there are blogs as well that you can use um, that have all the information you need on UCAP, BMAT and other things like that. And we do have our own blog competition. So if you guys want to like enter our blog competition, um, there's, um, if you go onto our website, you can um, submit a blog to us. I think Anna's going to talk uh, a bit but... about it at the end. So yeah, okay, we'll introduce it later, of course. Thank you for mentioning it, Lee. Sorry, I'm just mending the slide for you guys right now.
Okay, that should be the right link for you guys to use now. Um, in terms of the pre-conference form, um, if you guys do want to enter our giveaway, then it is essential that you need to fill in our pre-conference form, pre-conference form, our feedback form for the 13th and the 14th of um, both of uh, February. February. Yes, it is February. Mm. And there's a question asking us if the pre-conference form is the same as yesterday, it is, and you do not fill it in if you've already responded. Is that all right? So don't fill it in twice. Um, it's just because we wanna know who's making up our audience today. Um, and then happy Valentine's Day, somebody wrote. <laughs> you too. We are spending it with you. Imagine how lonely our lives are. <laughs> we can't say that. They asked us about our social lives, okay? No, no, no. Exactly. Our social lives are fine. You our guys social can... lives are fine, but it's minimal due Listen. to COVID, guys, okay? Yeah, it's minimum yeah. due to COVID, but you can still go to medical school and have friends and be in a relationship. It can be done. You just, yeah, you <sighs> pick. <laughs> Mayuri seems like such a happy person. Somebody wrote. She actually is. I am a very happy person. She is person. a very yes. happy person. She's I very try lovely. to be. Someone has to be, right? <laughs> oh, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's borderline insulting. I'm joking. I'm joking. Anna's the sassy one, I think, about everyone. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I just say things the way they are. Yeah, even Gab's agreeing. <laughs> yes, I think everyone everything. thinks so. It's just the culture, guys. That's just how I was brought up. How we do things. Someone needs to put us in our place. That's <laughs> <Anna's> job. <laughs> and somebody's asking, where can I find the post-conference form for yesterday's session? 
I think our beautiful YouTube master, YouTube masters, have put that in the YouTube description. Um, so let me just check that for you. Yes, post conference feedback form. Um, hashtag e I two MS conference Saturday twenty twenty one. Make sure you're doing the Saturday one and not the Sunday one, okay? Because of course you can't tell us how Sunday went yet, as Sunday is not done. And someone's have... just um quickly just to point out, someone's asked us all for relationship advice. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> guys? Really? <laughs> I am not qualified in that department. Who wrote? Who wrote? They are being married to medical school. That's very sad. Oh, that was guys. me. <laughs> Are you all friend, friends that meet in person? No, we all met because we've never done into med school in person. We started at the beginning, like in September 2020. So very few of us have actually met in person. I don't think, yeah, I met Gabs pre this. Yeah. And hopefully we're seeing each other for a socially distanced walk next week. So that'll be good. But as you can see, even if we haven't met in person, there still is very good banter between us. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, it's 11 o'clock. Our um, next talk, this has been one that has been waited for. So if we can go to the next slide, we have how to pick a medical school with Lee, our secretary, and then two of our volunteers who are mentors for into med school. Stani Mir and AD, who will talk to us about case-based learning and problem-based learning. They will also give you some tips about being medical students, some tips for your application process and more. So guys, take it away. Perfect. Hi guys, um, I'm Lee. If you didn't hear my introduction earlier, I'm a first year medical student at Imperial College London. And uh, just before we get started, I, if any of you have any questions, please use Slido and the link is in the description below. Next slide, please. So uh, just before we start, I just wanted to say two things. Um, all of this slide contains my own personal opinions and the information was provided is correct at the time of use. Next slide. So I think like choosing a medical school in general is a really hard process. And I think there's only two ways to answer. Essentially, it's where you get in, and secondly, it's a personal choice. So in this talk, I'm gonna try and cover like how to maximize your chances of getting in, but also touching upon personal choices that should influence where you put, what medical school you put for your UCAS. Next, next slide, please. So I don't know if it's been covered yet, but this could be really good um, for you, and certainly it helped me. So if you think about medical school applications as a hurdle or a running base, and the aim is to get the interview. So medical school applications typically start in the AS year or GCSE year, hence uh, year 11. And the first hurdle is GCSEs. You need to normally pass maths and English to progress onto the next level. Once you get your GCSEs, then you pick your AS subjects. And typically in ASCA, you normally do volunteering. And it's a step-by-step -step process I want you to think about it. And the aim is to get the interview. So as you can hear, see, there's plenty of hurdles that's stopping you to get the interview. And in this talk, we'll try and cover most of it. The UCAT and BMAT has been covered before, so I'm not going to go into too much details about this. Next slide. So I think it might be more fitting to say they choose you and mainly because of the selection criteria they've put in place. Next slide. So why do we have a selection criteria? I think with all of you and particularly those in year 13, like mo most people you do talk to want to study medicine. And I think we all have to remember that applying to medical schools, there's only 400 places say at Imperial. And when you have too many people apply, this creates what Darwin would say a selection pressure. So medical schools have to come up in a way to pick their application, their students they want. And they do this by creating these hurdles and try to pick off the students they don't think that would fit into their medical school. Now, 
if you don't get the interview or if you don't get an offer, it's really important to say you're, it's not that your application wasn't good. It was, it's more that they don't believe you suited their medical school. So, for example, I didn't get in on my first time. I reapplied and I got in. And that's because I fell at one of their selection hurdles. Next slide, please. So I kind of wanted to show you what you can do to maximize your chances. So I put a red line on the screen at um, just before the interview. So I want you to think of this as a game. The aim is to get the interview. So there's so many hurdles in the way of getting the interview. You have volunteering, you have work experience, you have A2 predicted grades, you have personal statements, and you have UCAT. UCAT and the predicted grades. So what you need to think is where am I likely to fall down and where am I likely to succeed? So typically most people can fall at any single circle stage. So volunteering, one of the screening processes are personal statements. In your personal statement, have you done your volunteering? Have you reflected on your per uh, volunteering? Work experience. Do you know what you're getting into? Like, do you understand that medicine isn't about the money? It's about long hours. It's about meeting people. It's about the science as well. To get an offer, you need to get the interview and do well in the interview combined with getting the exam results. So as you can see, there's so many hurdles that you can fall down in. But that's the good thing about into med school. We can help you with we or at least we try and help you with every single step of the way. So if you came to our conference yesterday, we had Anna and Mayuri talking about work experience. This morning, Rohan and Adrian was talking about UCAT and BMAT. And this is why we're here for. We're here to help you. And this is why I really encourage you just like attend all our events because we're all med school uh, students. We've gone through the process and we're here to help you. Next slide, please. So that's why sometimes it feels like this. You're carrying the weight of the world kind of um, at your feet and you're trying to jump over so many hurdles. And it, I know it seems impossible, but you can do it. And um, personally, when I was in year 13, it was so overwhelming to get into a med school. And just to come back to my, um, Adrian, Adrian's point earlier, if anyone was around, one year in year 13 seems like the whole your whole life is going to change but it's only 12 months and um i think it's so important that 12 months is nothing in comparison to the rest of your life next slide please so how to go about it as i was saying try to get the interview look at your application pick out your strengths is it the personal statement you're really good at is it the work experience you're good at? Are you really, um, is it the academia and your past achievements? Like, have you got all A stars predicted? Then you'd go to Oxbridge, for example. And in my opinion, most things come down to your admission exams. So you really want to try your best for these admission exams. And generally, the higher you score from them, the more likely it is to get the interview. I know this isn't the case in most places, like this is the case in most places, but there are a few exceptions. Next slide, please. And just coming back to this point, the most important things, in my opinion, are the UCAT and BMAT, just because this is how med schools can decipher between two applications. Because I think what we need to remember is all applications in year 13 have done their work experience, has done their volunteering, have got a really solid personal statement, have done their GCSEs. And the UCAT is the exam where everyone has to sit it and you can be directly compared to one another. And you can, they can say, this candidate scored five points more than this candidate. Now, I don't agree with the UCAT and BMAT in terms of how can they project how well you'll do at med school, but this is something med schools I found really cared about it. Next slide, please. So I've listed the universities that do accept them. In your own time, I'd recommend you looking into these if any of these um, particularly interest you. And next slide. 
and I've uh, me and my friends came up with this uh, small timetable, um, a UCAT um, list on where you can apply. So I think the most important thing with UCAT is think where is my school based. So as you as you heard uh, half an hour ago, some med schools have a high UCAT cutoff. So these are typically Edinburgh, Kings, and Newcastle. Some have a low UCAT. These are Cardiff, Kiel, Queen Belfast, and Plymouth. But these can change. There's no guarantee that saying having um, 650 will mean I'll get an interview. There's, you can't guarantee that until the application cycle's done. And by that time, it's too late. So my advice would be do your research. If you are coming to, um, if you are coming to apply, if you're coming to apply, think. Don't apply to, if you have a score of 610, don't apply to Kings because they won't like your application and you're most likely to be rejected. Next slide, please. So BMAT, um, I've just taken a list of BMAT uh, universities on the BMAT website. For more information, please visit their website. Um, and as you heard in a previous talk, um, a BMAT is another admission exam that typically Oxbridge and Imperial and UCL leads would require. Next slide, please. So GCSEs, and this is one question I always guess, get asked, does GCSE matter? And I think there's been a really progressive approach to move away from GCSEs. So now, before we're in um, year when I was in school a few years ago, GCSEs was a major part. So in a selection process, people would count your GCSEs and wait here. Now, Imperial, Bristol, Sheffield have said, so long as you meet the requirements, which are generally a pass in maths and English, and of course you have to check, you can't take my word for this, but when I was applying, um, Imperial, Bristol and Sheffield were like, they don't care about GCSE so long as you pass, and they'll base everything on UCAT. So don't, if your teachers tell you, oh, you can't apply to medicine because of your GCSEs, you need to tell them, no, GCSEs don't matter if you apply to certain med schools. And I, my mentor, so um, in into med school, we have a mentoring service and I, I have a mentee myself. And my mentee's teacher told her, your GCSEs aren't good enough. Um, and this is such a common case. Um, your, um, your GCSEs aren't good enough. You'll never get into med school. And I want, one thing I want you to take away today is if you want to do medicine, don't let your teacher put you off. You can get amazing A-levels. GCSEs don't mean anything at the end of the day. I mean, I'm talking about myself. I go to Imperial and I barely remember, um, um, I barely remember my GCSEs physics, for example, or phys GCSE um, English. Like English does, okay, maybe English is not the right example, but GCSEs are important at the time, but like, they're not detrimental to your medical application. Next slide, please. So just to conclude this part, I guess. So do your research. The Medic Portal is extremely good. Each medical school website will have a selection process listed on their website. Do Before you apply to them, make sure you know how to get the interview. So if they say they're looking at the UCAT, make sure your UCAT will typically reach their cutoff. So if Kings are telling me you need 700 typical, um, 700 to get an interview and I only have 650. Now you can see 700s up here, 650s here. I'm not going to get an interview. Do not apply, basically. Some people, some places are really clear, like Imperial, and they say they come up with a cutoff. But some places like UCL are like, will look at an application holistically. And what does holistically mean? Like, I, I honestly don't understand their selection process. And if you're applying to some places where they'd say, let's look at it holistically, um, well, you're in for a treat, I guess, because you can't guarantee you'll get an interview. And apply where your strength lies. So folk, when I, at the beginning of the talk, I circled every single hurdle you'll have. So personal statement, UCAT, 
if your strength is a UCAT, apply to a university where the UCAT is weighted so much because the aim of the game is to get an interview. At the interview, then you can sell yourself. And interviews aren't as scary as they think, as they seem. And we can do another talk another day and about interviews. Next slide, please. So coming back to this, there's no easy answer to choose a med school. And the other part that you need to weigh up is your personal choice. Now, where do you want to go? Next slide, please. So you need to think out where will it go where will it feel like home? And right now I understand like it's hard. It's hard to know where, if you'd like to live in London. It's hard to like know if you would be suitable in the countryside, um, for example, or in Scotland. And I think that needs to play an important part. So make all the opportunities as you can to like try and learn more about the med school. So think about the size of a med school, is the transport links, like how far the hospital, teaching hospitals from the universities. So part of uh, medicine is you use the, clin the clinical side is around three years. And that involves moving around hospitals and learning. Now, are the hospitals in the middle of nowhere or are they close to the center of the unis? So in Imperial, we have a lot in London and the transport links between them are really good. But in other places, you might need to take Ubers and these are expensive. The course modules, are they flexible? Are they engaging? So in Imperial, again, sorry, I do go to Imperial, so I'm a bit biased and I do think that's a really good med school. In Imperial, for example, we have something called a lifestyle prevention unit and we learn about things like sleep, about exercise, about nutrition and so much more, but how lifestyle can influence health. The learning start. And this is something we'll cover more as the talk progresses. How do you like to learn? And welfare and jobs and extracurricular. I think these also play a massive part into what do you want to get out of med school? Next slide, please. So one major factor isn't emphasized enough. And personally, I never knew this existed. Like when I applied to med school, I didn't know the base what PBL means, what CBL means, what integrated means, what traditional means. And in the next few slides, we're going to introduce you to speakers from these universities, and I'd recommend you to listen, okay? So at the interview, you'll always be asked, why did you pick this university? And the learning style is the best way to get into, get around that question, because learning style shows you understand what you're in for. Next slide, please. So what do I mean by learning style? The learning style is how do I learn best? So in the purple box, there's four types of learning styles, I, I think. There could be more, but these are the main four. There's traditional, integrated, CBL, and PBL. And I've put like questions um, to on the slides. Um, how do you learn best? And this is what you need to think about. Next slide, please. So I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker who's going to talk about CBR, CBLs and what this is involved. OK, hi, um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, thanks, Lee. My name is Stan. Stan Amir. I'm a um, first year graduate entry medical student at Warwick. And I just wanted to start uh, by reiterating Lee's point that applying strategically is really, really important. There's no point applying to a medical school where you know you're probably, you don't have a chance of getting in. So yeah, if you get one thing of this, if you take one thing out of this talk, do that. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about case-based learning, which is one of the um, learning styles that is used in quite a few of the medical schools in the UK. So up uh, next slide, please. So um, you will see after this, you will hear about problem-based learning, but the two are, are very, uh, very similar and they often are used interchangeably, but there are, there are some differences which we will um, outline in this. Um, so what case-based learning is, it's part of the um, curriculum uh, at medical school, which introduces you to uh, the knowledge that you need to have, but um, 
you know, in order to progress to the next stage. But uh, the way you do that is you arrive at this knowledge yourself. So it's not always given to you directly. Uh, it's not always something that is taught at you. It's something that you need to explore for yourselves. So usually it will focus on a patient case. So you will be given, uh, uh, you know, Often they're real life cases uh, of patients that clinicians have um, encountered and you will have a structure which during your session that um, now these sessions are taking place um, online, but usually they will be in, in a classroom, you and your um, colleagues are usually in a group of about eight to 10, but this can vary uh, by uh, medical schools, uh, you will get to discuss this patient case with your, um, with your colleagues and you will be following a structure that's given to you uh, and you will be arriving at different different um, conclusions. There is a facilitator there, um, so oftentimes that can be, um, you know, a clinician or it could be uh, an academic from your university, but they don't have a lot of input. So really the onus is on you to uh, be um, discovering uh, the prompts that the case uh, that the case is giving you. But the facilitator will be uh, making sure that you're sticking to your um, learning objectives uh, and that um, if you're not clear about anything, they will provide you uh, with some guidance and they will clarify things that you might need but it's very important to note that the facilitator is not there to teach you so it's not um small group teaching it's small it's small group learning so you don't have a tutor there that is sort of um lecturing you in in your group of eight they're they're in more of a, a supportive role um so next slide please so in um, case-based learning, as I said, you will have a team of, of varying sizes, but it won't be a very large one. And there will be different roles uh, during the session that you have. And these roles, um, they will uh, change session on session or depending on how you decide this with your, with your um, group. And what these roles are designed to do is to help you run this session more smoothly. So on the screen, you can see uh, some of the um, uh, roles that uh, you know typically are present they might be uh, called different uh, things at different universities this is what we just call them at uh, Warwick but they will be you know they'll be very similar in what they do so you have a chair who is sort of responsible uh, for the whole uh, session and who will make sure that you're um, sticking to the time that you're progressing that you're hitting all the um, learning objectives with the help of the um, facilitator you will have a presenter which in, in the days of um, Zoom and uh, Microsoft Teams has become very important. So they will be the ones who are uh, reading out, uh, you know, either if it's a slide app, if it's a slideshow or a handout that's been given to you um, so that everyone sort of um, gets, uh, so everyone sort of participates. Uh, and you have a scribe whose role is very important because they will be taking notes. They will be uh, making sure any tasks that you set out are um you know, recorded, and then uh, people can go back to these notes that the scribe has taken later on uh, in their um, in their own time, so that they can re remind themselves of what was discussed in the in the session. And you will often have someone, or uh, you know, multiple people who are doing research. So during the session, you will be faced with things that you've never heard before, and that's completely normal. That's what um, the CBL uh, process is all about. But you, it's very helpful to have these. Um, researchers who, uh, while you're talking about a certain topic, they will go away and they will just look up something really quickly to give you a general understanding and an overview of what it is so that when you go to um, do that yourself afterwards, you're not uh, completely uh, sort of in the unknown about this. And depending on how your group works, you might have other roles uh, or you might, um, you know, you might decide that some of them do something um, slightly differently. And next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned a few times uh, about the CBL process, but what exactly um, is the CBL process? And if you, if you ask uh, people who do research in this area, they might tell you that um, case-based learning is a bit more structured than problem-based learning. But as I said, you'll see from the next talk that, that they are very similar. So the information will often be released in small chunks. So you will be given um, information about how the patient presents, and then you'll be talking about this. And you then might be given information about uh, any tests 
tests or scans that have been done and then you'll be talking about this and then you'll be given information about maybe what diagnosis was reached and you'll be talking about this in that way you're really uh, getting to think about uh, about your patient case and usually when you when you're uh, given some information you will go through defining any terms that you might know because it's really important that you, you know, you understand what you're talking about and you're not just going um, around sort of using different terms that are unfamiliar to you because you will see once you start medicine that, um, you know, there'll be so many new words that are thrown at you and you quickly start to start to pick them up. You often will be asked to identify the key cues. So, for example, if the uh, presentation was someone that has come with a stroke, you'll be asked to identify maybe what symptoms they presented with or is there anything in their history that um, maybe predisposed them to the stroke. And then often uh, the people who design the CBL um, cases will have set some questions for you. So, for example, um, if you if you are presented with a, a set of symptoms that a patient is presenting with, they will ask you, well, what is the science behind this? You know, um, in the stroke, in the patient that had a stroke, why did they get this symptom? Like, can you explain um, on on a, a sci on a scientific level what is going on? And they will often put you in the shoes of a clinician. So, what investigations do you want to order, and why why do you want to order these investigations? Again, can you explain why you're ordering a CT scan for someone that had head trauma? What are the risks um, and also they will often ask you before you've actually seen uh, the investigations they will always give them to you but before you've seen them what will you expect to see from this patient or how do you expect that this patient is going to um, is going to progress further and hopefully you can start to see how um, you can start to see how a process like CBL really gets you thinking and really puts you in the shoes of, of a doctor that has to think through all these things and you're not necessarily in a lecture where everything is given at you and you just have to you know go away and learn this so in my opinion it's a very beneficial process and that will aid you sort of throughout your career and oftentimes um, you will set some tasks for yourselves and you will go home um, you will you know you might do some research you might go to your teaching sessions um, labs anything like that uh, you might prepare some materials and when you come to the next session you're going to feed back to your colleagues and perhaps you will teach them what you learned and this will really make sure that you're um, consolidating what you've learned in the CBL process so next slide please here I've just tried to um, identify some of the um, sort of advantages and disadvantages of the CBO. And again, this is just my, this is my opinion, but um, hopefully um, others will agree with this. And I think one of the, the biggest two that I've put on are the first two ones there, um, that the whole idea of active learning, that you're uh, learning about these topics, not through something that is directly uh, given to you and it's ready there for you, but you are having to find out these things for yourself. And you will see that when you go to, um, when you sit exams, you will think to that specific case which you discussed with your colleagues and that's how the knowledge will come to you whereas it's a lot harder to just think of a specific lecture where you sat maybe for an hour in a lecture theater listening to someone explaining explaining to this to you and very importantly it develops your team working skills and i'm sure you've heard a lot about this but um it doesn't just stop at interview stage uh, you will need this for the rest of your medical school life and indeed your careers they will be asking you at interviews for any internships for your specialty training further on which obviously you don't need to worry about now but um it does you know it does really uh, help with making sure that you can work in a team you can you can listen to other people you can present to a group of students um and, and facilitators and that will really really help you um and as one of my facilitators used to say, uh, it's a ready-made group of friends. So, you know, you're allocated um, eight or ten people, and you meet them uh, a couple of times a week. So you are bound to make some friends, and it's just easy way to get into that. Uh, and really, you will see how um, all your knowledge that you've um, that you've gained in different modules will come uh, will come together, and you will see how it all pieces together. Uh, but of course, there are some. I wouldn't call them this advantages but maybe some challenges you do need to be self-disciplined because this is all your kind of it's coming from you um so you need to make sure you put in the work so that you can get out the most of this session and it can be time consuming uh you know doing your research um and making sure that you're prepared for the sessions um can be time consuming uh, and the next slide please 
I just wanted to leave you with um, a few quotes from a um, paper which a student wrote on case-based learning. You can see there it was in the journal um, Clinical Teacher. And uh, really this student um, kind of summarized why they felt CBL uh, was, was um, beneficial for them. Um, and it said students gain, gain knowledge most effectively from a more knowledgeable other. So you all bring different things um, to the table. Some of you will enjoy pharmacology more, others will enjoy anatomy more but when you come together you can really pull your strengths um, to one to one thing and uh, explore what 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 the case is about um, and as I hope has it has become clear from this um, from this part of the talk is that you really are there to work as a team and this is something that um, the General Medical Council wants you to be able to do when you become doctors uh, so it really is preparing you for for that journey ahead. So thank you very much for listening. I believe we have time in the end for questions and I'll be very happy to answer any of them. Thank you. And now we are on to um, problem-based learning. So I'll um, let Eddie take over. So hi, um, my name is Edie and I'm a first year medical student at Manchester University. Um, I chose Manchester because I felt that the teaching methods would best suit the way that I learn because at Manchester we have very early on clinical experience, um, full body dissection and problem-based learning, which are all very active ways of learning that keep you constantly engaged in the course and also keep on bringing back these real life applications of the medical information that is being studied. And on top of this, I thought that Manchester would be a really exciting city to live in with lots to do when not a medical school, which is really important to consider, both because medical school is long, but also because it's really important at medical school to think about your mental health and make sure that you're doing other things to um, maintain it. Um, so today, as mentioned, I'm going to be talking about problem based learning. Um, a teaching method that is incorporated into medical schools relatively recently. So it's actually incorporated in 1994 by Manchester University. Um, and the other universities that also have problem-based learning are Barts, East Anglia, Glasgow, Hull and York, Kiel, Peninsula and Sheffield. Each medical school uses PBL with a different amount of weighting and also every university uses other teaching methods as well, like lectures. Um, so like CBL, PBL is a um, team approach to tackle weekly cases and you're, it's requiring self-directed studying which keeps you actively engaged in the information that you're processing at all times. At the same time, it's less structured than CBL, with students interpreting the, informa the important information covered in the case themselves, whilst the facilitator only occasionally intervenes with the, and redirecting the students away from re irrelevant information and informs the students if they're going into too little or too much detail. Um, Topics that will be covered in the case are often known in advance for CBL, but this is not true for PBL, as topics of interest are decided during the first PBL meeting of the week and by the students. Um, these are called group learning objectives or GLOs and are generated in the discussion of the case to guide the week's research, but I'll come back to those later. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, you've gone too many slides. Um, previous slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so the structure of PBL is the same every week. So that all students participate in addressing the case and one student per week is elected as chair and one as scribe. These roles alternate each week among the group. The chair leads the discussion throughout, encouraging the group to move on to each area of the case and the scribe writes up all of the areas of interest discussed in the case. The students read through the case and then define all the words in the case which were unfamiliar before. And the students also discuss the important topics covered in the case and separate these into um, areas that need further research called group learning objectives, which I mentioned before. The number of group learning objectives vary slightly between weeks and also vary between PBL groups in the same university. 
but your facilitator will make sure that um, you have all of the required areas of research. At the beginning of the week, many details of the case are unfamiliar and some words are actually quite daunting because they're stuff that you've never seen before. But as the week progresses and you do more research and you have more lectures, you unpick the case aided by your own research. At the end of the week, you reconvene with your seminar group to revisit the case with this new knowledge and you discuss the conclusions that you've made throughout the week. The case is often reread and then the students, uh, sorry, next, next slide. Thank you. Um, and the students address each question on the group learning objectives, taking it in turns to contribute to answering uh, each question. Discussions about the information are encouraged, but then the facilitator makes sure that you don't deviate too far away from the areas that are needed to be um, studied. Again, the chair leads this discussion, but makes sure that all students have an equal amount of contribution in the session. So personally, I find PBL is, um, makes medical school information more digestible. And also it demonstrates the clinical application of your medical knowledge, constantly connecting you to the profession that you want to, to study. Um, it is a very satisfying process as you're, collecting, as you're collectively untangling a case which at the beginning of the week is a medical mystery to you. Um, online, PBL is often described as self-directed, but that's not something to be scared about because there's always help from your facilitators and your other peers if you are finding an area of the case more difficult than you thought it would be. With regards to these peers, every semester you have a new group of students, approximately six to 12 people, depending on what university that you're at, and you work with each uh, on each case with them in the term. Of course, this is a great way to meet like-minded medical students. And as said before, like CBL is a great way to make friends, but it's also really good to, for a learning, um, a, a way to learn because if they're um, in discussions at the beginning and the end of the week, you might, if there was something that you didn't understand or mis misunderstood or even information that you'd like to solidify, your peers' contributions can really help you to do that. And at Manchester, we also have these groups for anatomy. And so you're making these really strong connections in the medical school that can help you the whole time. And it's nice because you have new students every term. So you're meeting such a wide range of people. So if you don't get on with the people in your first PBL group, you'll be best friends with the ones in your second. So that's really good as well. Um, communication skills are obviously very important to be a good doctor. And if you're someone that finds that challenging, PBL can be a really good place to um, improve that and practice that. And um, because it's a team, it's a team uh, process where you all have to contribute. It's a friendly environment um, where all suggestions, whether they end up being right or wrong, are really valuable because they help carry on discussions into the areas that you, that you brought up. Um, because there's a lot of information to cover at medical school, associating chunks of content with each case is also really useful in making sure that you remember them. I, I would say that the main downside of PBL is that as CBL, it requires a lot of self-discipline, uh, self-motivation and organisation. And it's often difficult to know how much depth to go into each topic topic and how long each topic will take you to research and understand and so sometimes you find that you've gone into one area too much and one area too little. Um, but these self-driven elements are really important to acquire if you want to be a good doctor because this is going, something that you're going to have to be able to do while, while in hospitals. PBL is definitely not for everyone but I find that it pushes 
my engagement in the course and I have benefited from bouncing off other students uh, inputs in my group and I feel as well that the self-led research makes sure that I really understand every new concept which is very new to anything that I've studied before instead of just rote learning a list of information that I've been given to memorize. It's a very new learning experience for me and everyone else starting medical school but it is definitely been something that I've really enjoyed during my first year at medical school. Um, as mentioned before, if anyone has any questions that they don't think I've covered, I think there's going to be time at the end to do that. But for now, I'll hand back to Lee. Perfect, thank you. So, slide please. So I'm going to be talking about two types of approaches about med school. So we have integrated and intercalate, um, traditional and integrated approaches to med school. Next slide, please. So what is a traditional course? So tr traditional course, Imperial is a bit weird because we both, we do traditional at the beginning of the year and then move towards a more integrated approach. So you can't really see from my calendar, but like I tried to show you that a traditional course is mainly for, filled up from lectures after lectures after lectures. So this was um, my calendar from the start of the year in November. And again, I'm a first year medic at Imperial. And you can see on my Friday, we'd have lecture after lecture after lecture. And this is typical of a traditional course. Next slide, please. So what is a traditional course? So a traditional course is defined by two or three years preclinical. So this is studying. Um, the science behind all the uh, diseases, and then followed by three years in hospitals and GP placements. The first three years, you do small based learning, so in lectures, in tutorials, and then later you learn the clinical side, so how to talk to your patients, how to take a history. Next slide, please. So I've listed the pros and cons, and in your own time, it would be good to pause here and just like read into this. The benefits are you have a strong medical foundation, but at the same time, part of being a doctor involves really uh, talking to patients, communicating with patients, knowing what questions to ask. And these are the cons of attending places such as Cambridge, Oxford, uh, potentially UCL has a more traditional than integrated approach. Next slide, please. So, Integrated is what we do at Imperial College London, and it seems to be the new way of doing things. So if you think of a smoothie maker, I think, and you put lecture base, but you add, so you mix both clinical and preclinical together. And instead of doing clinical for three solid years and um, preclinical for three solid years, you mix them together and you do both of them for the six years. Next slide, please. So I tried to show you, um, I, I appreciate you can't see it really clearly, but I tried to show you what a typical traditional course is like. So in green, we have the lectures. In pink, we have like small based learning. And in purple, we have uh, clinical placements. As you can see from my Tuesday and Thursday, we have something called exploring lifestyle and social history. And these essentially are acting and they t um, acting like clinical scenarios. So we'd go into a hospital and then we'd act and we'd develop these clinical skills. And these are quite key in these integrated approaches where you learn as you go how to communicate. What questions do you ask when you get social history? And this is why I think defines a integrated approach. Next slide, please. We also have placements. So from first year, we have GP placements. So as well as doing our lectures Monday to Friday, on Thursdays, we have a opportunity to be going into our GP and learning and talking to real life patients. Next slide, please. So I know I covered integrated and traditional really fast, but I think traditional is more lecture based and integrated is more the lectures plus clinical um, based. Um, in your own time, I'd recommend reviewing the pros and cons for each of them. And I just want to wrap up because we're nearing the end of the talk. So to summarize the talk, I think um, 
picking where you go to med school is both a personal choice and ultimately it depends where you get an offer. Some people might get all four offers, some people might get one offer. Just be comfortable, wherever you apply to, you might have to go if you don't have other choices. And that means you might not have an easy answer. Apply to places you do want to go. Don't apply for the sake of saying, oh, if I get in, I, prob I might not get into this one, uh, but I don't really want to. Like medicine is medicine and research every single place you're meeting. So don't apply to places where you know you'll get rejected. For example, a low UCAT score and you apply to one with a strict high cutoff. Next slide, please. So I've got a few tips and they're both my personal tips and I've got my mentee to give us some tips. Next slide. So I asked my mentee, I had a meeting with my mentee uh, last week and she said in year 12, the two things she wished she knew was how important the entry exams are and a way to balance A-level entry exams and a social life to prevent burning out. And I think when you start approaching the med school application, and it's really great you came today, but like really appreciate how important the UCAT and BMAT are. And I think it's right for me to say they are hard exams and personally, I hate them. But like there's so many resources and there's so many ways that you can come, you can become more confident doing the BMAT and UCAT. Next slide, please. So I just really wanted to end with a final point. And just remember, medicine is med medicine. It's like in year 13, I was like, OK, I want to do medicine at Imperial uh, Oxford, Cambridge, blah, blah, blah. But like at the end of the day, it there's no set time limit or there's no places you have to go. When you graduate medicine, you'll get a GMC license and that means you can become a doctor. I promise it will be worth it, okay? I love medicine personally, but sometimes during my gap year and when I'm re reapplying, I, it just didn't feel like it. And spending your summer holiday revising for your UCAT, finishing your personal statement, revising for mocks, it just feels like an endless circle. And if you put the effort in, get the confidence to do the UCAT, the BMAT, and when you get your offer, it will be the best feeling ever. If you don't get in the first time, don't worry. Like I didn't get in the first time and now I'm at Imperial, so things do work out. Just perceive and like continue. If you really want to do medicine, you will get into medicine. And work hard, make sure you revise for your mocks. Predictive grades are everything. Make sure you practice for the BMAT, the UCAT. Make sure you try and minimize where you can fall down. So at the earlier slides, I talked about the hurdles. This application process is a running or a hurdle exercise. You need to jump through the hoops to get an interview and then jump through the interview to get the offer and then jump through the predicted grade, like the final grades to get in. Treat it like a exercise like that and you'll do well. I know at times it's like medicine, like my friends are getting offers in, let's say, October. Medicine is for the long run. At least when you finish medicine, you will get a GMC. You will get a job. So don't panic, okay? Just like stick with it and I'm sure it will work out well. Next slide, please. And if you take one thing away, do your research. Do not apply to places where you don't meet the criteria. You are just a number to a med school. They don't, they don't care if they, you don't meet their criteria. Sorry to scare people, but like you need to learn and you need to know where you're applying. So let's say I'm applying to Imperial. Will I get an interview is a question you need to ask yourself. If your scores don't add up for an interview, apply to somewhere you will get an interview next slide please and i hope you enjoyed this talk uh, we've got a q a session now so feel free to scan and drop us some comments and we're all happy to answer comments and questions if you wish cool so some questions that have been asked um they're all very very good however we've been answering some of them uh, but we left some for you guys. 
So they really want to know what is a good way to cope with stress and workload for you and how do you keep a good work-life balance? Oh, that's a good question. I think like having a supportive network is the best uh, way to cope with stress and really just like relax. Like in med school, like you'll meet so many people and there, there'll be some people you click with and some people you don't click with. And just like, just, you don't need to study all the time, but when you do study, make sure you're studying correctly. And I think there's plenty of information on how to study. Um, I haven't perfected it myself. I'm sure most people haven't perfected it, but just realize like you don't have to study all the time and um, just have a nice supportive network is my opinion. I would say as well, it's really good if you um, make your life more than just what you're studying. And so maybe if you love music or you love sports or you love art, if you have something else, then it, it takes away a little bit of the pressure. Because if all you do is study because you're not studying, as mentioned in the right way, then it everything, every loss that you have you know every loss of a mark or a grade which will happen the whole time in medical school feels so much worse than it than it actually is and so if you can find balance in your life and, and add things to it that that enriches your life then that's a really good way to uh decrease stress as well and to know that ev feeling stress at medical school is normal that everybody is finding it difficult it's not a walk in the park and so you don't need to feel like you need to be acing it the whole time it's difficult and to know that everybody is going through the same thing as you great guys uh next up we have how often do you guys do pbl and cbl question um sessions and when do you have lectures so i think um it was mentioned in the PBL talk that Manchester do it three times a week. I think it varies, but I think that's a good, that's usually uh, most often the case three times a week. So at Warwick, we do have two which are with a facilitator and then a third session, which we have to organise ourselves. And they take about um, just under two hours, I would say. And I think that's quite standard for most places. We actually, in Manchester, we have two sessions. We've got one at the beginning of the week on on for example, the Monday, and then one at the end of the week with the facilit both with the facilitator. And then during the week, um, we just have lectures and se other seminars. So for example, anatomy seminars or uh, consultation skill seminars, which is when you're practicing how to communicate with patients. And so in the week, if you want to discuss the case with um, the other people on your course, that's up to you to meet up like in Warwick. That's on your watch. Yeah, and I think um, it's important to say, because I was looking at the um, Q&A uh, on the website, um, it's, so it's never going to be only PBL or only CBL, you are always going to have lectures and tutorials. It, I think Lee covered it really well in the integrated approach. So some places will not have the CBL and they will only, um, you know, only be giving you lectures. That's what we mean by the, by the traditional approach. When you do have CBL or, or PBL, it will always be supported by some sort of other teaching, you know, whether that's lectures, tutorials, seminars, um, workshops, labs, all that kind of thing. So um, CBL and PBL are really there to bring the whole, to bring bring all your teaching together that you've had in different various um, sessions so hopefully that kind of um, clarifies a little bit uh, the people yeah oh, I think can I quickly interject really quickly please go for Sorry, it I was, making, I was making a social media post for intermed school and someone apparently asked about um, QM and I'm just gonna say that yes yeah, like Lee's already said every course is integrated it's not like you only do PBL so at Bart's we do in first and second year, mostly twice a week, you do PBL sessions, one at the beginning and one at the end. And then in third year and onwards, we've been doing CBLs this year. Um, and that can be one or two sessions a week. Um, so we have a bit of both. Um, but that's on obviously on top of all your lectures and other things that you get to do. 
And I think just because I saw quite a few people um, ask again, the differences between PBO and CBO and trust us, sometimes we're not even sure what the difference between PBO and CBO is. But I think one way to, um, one way that I found that described it online was um, open inquiry and guided inquiry. So in CBO, a lot of the questions that you need to focus and a lot of the learning objectives are already provided for you. Whereas in PBO, it's more on you to set the questions and to find out what the learning objectives are so I think that's one way of um, of looking at it uh, people you know people have different experiences but at the end of the day it does come down to you working in a team with other people on a patient case so in its essence is very similar thank you so much guys and last question we're gonna take I know that you guys have asked so so many and I'm so sorry if we aren't able to cover all of them but I think today we must have had like 400 questions already so um, how do you figure out what form of learning is best for you? Like, how does one know if they'll thrive in a PBL heavy degree or in an integrated degree, in a traditional degree and so far so on? Uh, I'll start really quickly and keep it brief. I think like you learn, I think at school you learn in a classroom, like how do you like learning? Do you prefer the classes where the teachers talk at you for 45 minutes or an hour? Do you prefer like when you work in small groups? And I know it's not like the ideal scenario now everything's online, but like think back when you were in year 10, year 11, like in the subjects you did well, how did you learn? And that's the question you have to ask yourself, I think. I think as well, it's important to remember that no matter where you go, there will be a lot of similarity between learning methods. So you're you'll have lectures most likely and you'll you'll have seminars and you will have some group learning of some sort um but like um lee said if you enjoy active learning and you enjoy bouncing off other people and you like speaking about what you're learning and you you hearing it out loud makes more sense to you then something like pbl or cbl is m more for you whereas if you like being just sort of spoken at and, and that's the way that you learn then maybe a more traditional way would be good for you thank you so so much guys and i think it's now time to give all of our attendees a little break and we will be back at 12 with the talk about mental health and social experiences of our medical school once again um thank you so so much ed and sunny miran lee for um giving us this talk and teaching our attendees something that they weren't really um, aware of. Thank you, you've been really great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so welcome to um, our coding slide before we begin our next talk. So one thing that I want to bring your attention to is we are going to have a chance for you to write a blog post about a reflection on how the conference went um, for the past two days. And if you scan this QR code or put in the link, um, you'll be able to uh, fill in our Google form and upload your reflective writing piece. So the way it works is that everyone who submits a reflection of reflective writing will get a certificate of submission um, due to your hard work for writing it and top the top 10 pieces will be picked by the committee and they will be posted onto our social media as well as our website that will be on there and this will be a chance for you to learn how to use the reflective cycle that was mentioned in one of our talks yesterday and this is an essential part in medical school because as a medical student you will need to learn how to write uh, reflective writing pieces and it is essential in um, all of your years throughout medical school and this would be a great chance for you to basically just get started on it. If you are a mentee um, in, our, in, in our program, you can talk to your mentor and ask for help in terms of how to write your reflective blog uh, piece and you can ask them to review it before you um, upload it to our Google form. And if you have any further questions, just feel free to put in a Q&A or uh, write it uh, email the events at intermedschool.com. And then on the right hand side, we've got our pre conference form um, for you to fill in if you'd like to enter our Medify giveaway 
where they are offering a free UCAT course to one lucky winner that is worth £150, roughly. Oh, I just wanted to add, actually, um, the Medify giveaway, the winner is not picked by us, it will be picked by Medify. So as soon as we hear from them, we will let you know who's won the giveaway. Just before I get a 10 million spam messages on Instagram asking me, who's won, who's won? <laughs> also, I think you guys will have time until the, the 18th, I would like to say. Yeah, yeah Thursday the 18th. Time. So do not ask us who's won until Thursday because we will not know. Is that yeah. right? We will post it on our Instagram and stuff as soon as we find out who's won. But yeah, the yeah. deadline is this coming Thursday in the evening at around six o'clock. We made a post about it, but I will share it everywhere yeah. again. I will Thanks. send an email out to every attendee who've registered um, for this conference with, with the links of the pre-conference form, both feedback forms, the reflective form, and the deadlines of when you need to fill all of them in. Okay, and we've got a minute until we begin our next talk. Um, someone's asking how long does the reflective piece ha have to be? Uh, I think I... Um, guys, if you go onto the Google form, there are all of the rules there. Literally all, all, all of the rules. How long it has, like, it, it can be what you can talk about. And then you can use the reflective cycle, which, as you know, we talked about yesterday. So you should know something about it. And also, if you are a mentee in this program, you can discuss writing the blog um, with your mentor. So, of course, it has to be your own work, but they can give you some feedback about it and um, you can improve it together. So, yeah, just read the questions. If you have any questions at all, just read the rules. If you have any questions at all, uh, DM us on Instagram or email us at events. But it's time now for the next talk, mental well-being and medical school. I think this is something very, very important to talk about because when you apply to medical school, you often hear things like, oh, you want to do medicine, so you won't have a life. Or if you say you want to be a surgeon and you're a girl, they'll tell you like, oh, so you don't want to be a mom and things like that. So I think it's very important that you guys um, get to learn about this as early on in the process which as you might have learned is itself draining even before getting into medical school. Um, so we have our speaker, I think you pronounce it Gayatri, and I hope that was good enough. Um, if not, <laughs> please let me know how I can improve. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Um, I actually go by the name Divya. Um, okay. so hi everyone, my name is Divya, and I am a third year medical student at Imperial. And I just want to say, first of all, a massive thank you to the Intermed School Committee and to Hannah as well for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to like reflect upon my experiences and share something with you guys as potential doctors of the future. Um, I really wish that I had had like this kind of support that you guys are able to access now. Um, so hopefully you'll learn something and hopefully I don't scare you <laughs> about medical school, but I am going to be talking about the reality of um, just the challenges that you face at medical school and, and also how to kind of overcome them and just how to keep well generally, both at medical school and sort of beyond. So next slide, please. So I'm going to be covering a little bit about me, um, a little bit about my experiences of becoming depressed at medical school and then also recovering. Um, also just explaining, you know, what is depression? What is burnout? Because these are phrases that, sorry, terms that we hear often at medical school. Um, I'm gonna be explaining why it affects medical students, doctors, nurses, and the healthcare professionals in general, why it affects them in particular. 
Um, and then, you know, how to recognise if you know that someone is struggling, how to pick it up, um, how to look after yourself. And also there was a question, I think, about can I apply to medical school if I've already gone through some medical mental health problems? So I'll be addressing that as well. So next slide, please. So um, just a little bit about me. So um, I think I relate to a lot of you guys in that I also come from a... I would say like an underprivileged background um, and I fall into like a different minority group um, in particular as I'm a refugee from Sri Lanka um, and we sort of fled when I was really little we fled the genocide of Tamils in Sri Lanka um, and so I suppose that meant that I had lots of different barriers to education growing up um, like my dad didn't really speak very much English the whole system was new the whole country was new and so I had no idea like how the application process worked and we're talking like eight years ago when I applied I think eight years ago maybe six yeah, yeah eight years ago when I was applying um you know there wasn't this like online conference style thing that was available if you didn't know anybody who did medicine it was very difficult to then kind of talk about like how can I get in what do I have to do so the whole system was really really difficult next slide please um, but thankfully, you know, I, I think I was really proactive and um, I, I went to a good enough school, I think, that really supported me. And I was very lucky to receive offers from both um, Cambridge and Imperial. Um, I suppose that and then uh, Imperial things sort of started to go a bit haywire. So next slide, please. And this is kind of where I went through depression. Um, next slide. Um, but thankfully, I was really lucky to be given some time to take some time out of medical school um, and to really kind of reflect on myself, learn to cope a bit more. And then I guess come back a stronger person. Um, next slide, please. Um, and just, yeah, like be able to like advocate for mental health. Um, next slide. Um, I'm really lucky because I think because of my experiences, I've been able to share it and sort of be in a position where I can yeah just like help other people a bit more so I guess at medical school now um I'm one of the vice presidents of psychiatry society and a lot of the depression I've been working through through like therapy and stuff which I'll talk about um but just something that sort of kind of came around off the back of that is a podcast that I did called stories of migration which is all about um the experience of migration and how being an immigrant in this country affects you in different ways um, particularly in terms of education and things like that. So next slide, please. Um, so going to university, can you click again? Sorry. Thank you. So, yeah, as I said, like going to uni was such a big deal for me and my family and my community because I had nobody in my family who went to university. Um, so the thing was that, you know, you, we, we had like worked out so hard to like get into medical school that after that I didn't really think about what the process would be like or like you can you can read about it you can be like oh like this is PBL this is integrated learning but the actual experience of moving away from home of living by yourself of having to you know be an adult and like regulate yourself these are things that I hadn't quite like thought about in my head and I think on top of that was the fact that when I started at Imperial, it was not very diverse at all. It's, it's massively changed now. They've really worked on their inclusivity and diversity. But certainly when I started, there were literally two black people in the entire year group. Um, everybody seemed to come from a place of money where their parents were doctors or their parents were in like, like high professions. And it was a real massive shock to my system because I had grown up completely differently. I had grown up with my parents. I, I mean, everybody works really hard, right? But I feel like my parents made so many sacrifices in order to give me the opportunity to have an education that they didn't have because of the racism and discrimination in Sri Lanka. So um, it was really strange because I had never been around people with like so much money in a different way of life. And so this kind of drink culture that you guys might have heard of where like you know you just drink loads at university particularly within medicine I just couldn't understand that I didn't I couldn't relate to that um and I just found it next slide sorry I just found it I it was I was really lonely basically like I just could not relate to the people around me in any way shape or form because they had just had such different life experiences um next slide please and I think on top of being so lonely 
was the massive workload that, you know, again, you hear about it, you know that medical school is stressful, you know that you have lots to study. But the actual experience of sitting there and for me, it was lecture based learning, sitting there in lectures nine to five every single day and not knowing how to learn. Like, I think there was a question previously, like, how do you know how to learn? Because, you know, at school, you're given homework, you're given um, as much as homework is annoying, you know, like you have to meet these deadlines or whatever. It means that it's, it's just an opportunity for you guys to like consolidate, to really think, what do I not know? What do I need to know? What do I need to revise? Whereas at university, you don't have, unless um, you do like PBL where you have to present what you know each week, with lecture-based learning, particularly Imperial, um, you're not checked on what you know and what you don't know until the very end, until exams. And so you just do loads and loads of lectures and you're just you know you're shoveled with all this information but how do you actually make sense of it how do you actually not just take it in and listen to it but actually then remember it um how, how do you do that I don't know like at that time it I just found it so hard like and I didn't like I said because my parents didn't go to university and because I didn't have anybody in my family who went to university I didn't know anyone who went to university I didn't exactly have like guidance from people I didn't know I couldn't ask anybody like, oh, can you help me with like how to study or how should I do this? I don't even know what to wear to lectures. Like it was, I was so lost when I went to uni. Next slide, please. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, like I just had no one to help me. And so next slide, I basically collapsed. And so in, at the end of my first year, start of my second year, um, things really started to go downhill. Next slide, please. Um, this is a bit of a scary slide, I think. Um, I don't want to scare you guys too much, but I do want to also be honest with like the reality of it. And so if I start with like the top um, circle at the, very at the very top, then, so like I said, there was like the stress of the loneliness, especially because I, I, I had been and I am now, thankfully having recovered. I'm very like very social person. And so going from having lots of friends to suddenly like not having any friends was really difficult. And then there was the workload that was super stressful. And then these two, two things together, it meant that I would stay up at night and I'd be like, oh, I need to get these lectures done. Or I need to study because I am, you know, I have this massive opportunity. To, I'm, I'm at medical school. I need to make the most of it. But I'm like failing miserably because there's so much to do. So I would just stay up and work. But it meant that, you know, when you lose out on sleep, you, you begin like even physiologically in your brain, your brain starts to change a little bit and you you become a bit more forgetful you become a bit more irritable a bit more angry um you start neglecting yourself a bit more you don't you don't eat as well you don't or maybe you overeat or you know you don't shower properly or there are these like subtle things that happen that initially you're like it's fine i just need to do the work so i just need to like pass because i'm here at medical school um but actually it it all builds up um and it got to the point where I was not only like chronically tired, but my moods started changing and I started becoming a lot more up and down, up and down. Um, and then it got to the point um, a few years later. So we're talking and start of second year, we're talking second year, sort of end of second year. I started becoming, yeah, like I said, like really low in mood and really, I just felt like I had no, nothing left within me, like nothing to give. Um, and because you know you guys are all like I presume you're all like really really high achievers you that's why you want to apply to medical school like you you already do so well but then I think someone else mentioned earlier like you get to medical school and suddenly you're with a bunch of people everybody does super well and you no longer have this like joy from achieving because everybody does so well so it's kind of like you don't you know you feel like you're not worth it anymore you feel like imposter syndrome the idea that you're there but someone has just put you there by mistake because look at all these amazing people around you how can you be there kind of thing is a real thing I've like spoken so many people about this but anyway um the point I was trying to make is that I was I felt really low I felt really hopeless I had such low self-esteem like going from a really confident person to um at my lowest of lows just really breaking um I became really suicidal and things just was you know I, it was it was crazy because I had never particularly like when I went to school no one really talked about mental health um and it 
even at medical school at that time anyway no one really talked about mental health and so I thought to myself oh like I have to be really strong I can't tell anybody because I have this one opportunity at education I have this one opportunity to become a doctor if I tell someone that I'm struggling then they're going to kick me out I was so like convinced that I would be kicked out of medical school that I just didn't tell anyone for the, for the longest time and this is a bad thing this is not what to do um but thankfully next slide please thankfully um at some point like I was like okay this is enough like I am not coping and I went to my doctor and um thankfully I had the opportunity to go through different therapies so I'll talk about these in a bit more detail um but I went through something called cognitive behavioral therapy so CBT is another way we refer to it and then I did go on antidepressants for, for a while some psychotherapy as well um but most importantly I think for me it was it was important to take time out of university to reflect on the little things that had happened in my life right from the start from being a refugee to being um you know the struggles of university I needed to reflect on that and I needed to really like process all of that so um next slide please um CBT I'll just talk about it really briefly because I think CBT is good for all of us um no matter at what stage and you'll come across this at medical school as well CBT is basically where you examine how your thoughts affect affect your behaviors and how your behaviors and things that you do affect the way that you feel and it's about breaking um the negative cycle for example if I think um let's say I think oh like I am a failure let's say I think I'm a failure then my behavior might be I might not eat because I might think I don't deserve food and then my emotions will be well I'm hungry and I'm annoyed and angry at myself and I think again I think oh, I'm even more of a failure and the cycle kind of continues whereas what CBT helps to do is to think how can I actually change the, the mood the emotions well I can have a look at the behaviors like I can have a look at what am what am I doing that's actually causing me to feel this way or think this way and so I went through these this like this kind of therapy and this was really really helpful for me um next slide please and the other thing that I did this is when I took some time out of medical school and um, was I went through psychotherapy and this is where you basically like you have a therapist this is kind of what you guys see might, might see in like the movies where there's like a therapist and you talk to them basically but it was kind of like it was just important for me to unpack um the genocide um and kind of how it had impacted my parents and how it had impacted me as a, a, a migrant as a refugee and how that had sort of caused this kind of culture shock and this that you know this these little things and the reason i talk about this is because i think it's important to realize that like everybody has a different story you know ever sure everyone at medical school is going to be a doctor at the end um but you know we all have different stories and therefore we all have different things in our lives that cause stress for me it was the genocide for other people it might be financial stress it might be relationship stress it might be um loss of a loved one it might be um housing issues it, it could literally be anything on the spectrum and because medical school is so stressful it means that anything else that happens in your life has the potential to induce more stress and therefore cause you to like i know unravel and so yeah anyway so talking and through psychotherapy that really really helped me and just taking time out in general really helped me um, and so i'm here now thankfully having recovered um but um yeah anyway so next slide please so what is depression and what is burnout next slide please next slide so um burnout you guys might have heard of burnout so burnout is essentially where you push yourself so much so so much to the extent that you literally feel burnt like you literally feel like you can't function anymore and it kind of starts with feeling super tired all the time um and this is this is not just like short-term tiredness where if you can go if you go to sleep you wake up the next day okay like you feel a bit rested this is you feel so tired that now when you wake up you just don't feel yourself you feel you're a bit more forgetful um you forget to do things that even you know you look at in the morning oh like in my diary i've got this written down and you still forget to do things um it becomes more difficulty sleeping which is what insomnia is um you might not feel like eating or you might feel like eating a bit too much um you might feel a bit more anxious about things you might feel a bit more ill um so it's kind of like your body basically feel not being rested 
as well and be just not being as functional now burnout is something that is kind of like this like interim period before it goes to depression often anyway for med medics um because you're so overworked i mean i'll talk about this in a minute later on in a slide as well but within medicine you know like you work emotionally and physically so much that you then feel like you're super tired all the time and so you can imagine how feeling super tired all the time like your body just being like i'm just tired just give me a break can then lead to actually you know what i'm so i feel so dysregulated that it that it becomes depression so then what is depression and what's the difference next slide sorry oh sorry there should be another slide there Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. Um, I'll just talk about it anyway. No, no, I think, I think the white thing just didn't move it. Um, and so depression is essentially where it gets to the point where you, your moods essentially change. So you wake up and you, and you feel like something's wrong. You don't feel joy from things as, as you used to feel. And you might feel um, even more angry, even more irritable, even more low, more worthless, more just it's low self-esteem um you just might feel a bit more hopeless essentially and so the tiredness kind of just results to the point where you just don't feel like yourself anymore so why is this a massive thing within medicine next slide please um this is a scary statistic that 54 percent of doctors say that they are burnt out 88 percent of doctors say that they're moderately or severely depressed and 59 percent of doctors wouldn't recommend a career in medicine to their children this is from 2014. I think this is really scary. The reality is that this happens when we don't look after ourselves. And this is why when you guys apply and when you guys do medical school, I really want to make sure that you don't feel like this. You know, we need to change the system. We need to make sure that um, not only doctors, but also all members of healthcare professionals feel like they are OK, like they are happy and they aren't burnt out. Um, so I hope this is not too scary, but because let's talk about how we can overcome this and how we can prevent ourselves from getting there in the first place. Next slide, please. So why does it affect medics in particular? Um, please, can you click again? So, I mean, really obvious, there is such a massive workload, like even with the pandemic, you might have heard so many. Um, yeah, you can keep clicking, I think, until. Yeah. Um, but basically, thank you. Um, even you know, with the pandemic, you would have heard loads that. We are so stretched, like there's not enough money within the NHS, not enough doctors within the NHS. And so people are working left, right and centre 24 hours a day and that ties you out. So people are burnt out. Um, and then there's the other part of it, which is that every single patient that you speak to has a story and it's emotional. You expend a little bit of your own emotions in talking to them. And so you become emotionally a bit more tired and you're so stretched thin and tired. And, you know, there's always something to learn, always something to do. Um, my, my family will often ask me like, oh, when do you finish medical school? And it's like, well, re in reality, even if I finish it after I've got another three years left. Even if I finish after those three years, there's still things to learn. There's still exams to sit. Even when you're a consultant, you'll still be reading all the coming, the papers that are coming out, or the um, you know the up to date bits of research, things like that. So there's always something to learn, always something to do. That it's very easy to neglect yourself. Next slide, please. So, how do you pick it up when it when it occurs well i kind of have mentioned this already um and you might you might even notice some of these things within people that you know or within yourself but in terms of what you see so if we look at the image on the left you might see people changing how they interact with you maybe skipping school maybe not coming into uni so much maybe not making that social event i mean we don't really have many social events because of lockdown anyway but you might you might see like they miss your calls they might not respond to your messages as much um and they start withdrawing now they also might doing th start doing things like not no longer like enjoying things that they used to enjoy so they might for example if they were like really good dancers before or, like they really enjoyed dancing before they might not enjoy that as much anymore they might be really irritable with you with you really angry with you their weight might change a lot as a result of not eating or overeating. 
um, they might just look a bit disheveled, a bit like look like they're not really taking care of themselves very much. And they might start doing reckless things like they might start um, drinking or they might start smoking or getting involved in drugs or certain these changes might start happening. The thing that we don't see, so if we look at the image on the right, is the kind of physical side of things. So the feeling of um, you're so tired that you can no longer get out of bed, or you can no longer like walk to the bathroom because your legs just feel like they don't work anymore. Um, the thoughts inside of like, you know, like I mentioned, like feeling like you're no longer worth it anymore, like life no longer has any meaning, all this sort of negative talking. Um, you might see they just don't have like that much motivation. Um, they, you might they not might they might not actually like tell you that, but they might feel that inside. They don't feel like doing anything anymore. Um, they might have difficulty concentrating. I, th I remember this was a massive issue for me personally, like sitting in lectures and feeling like I just can't concentrate because I'm so tired. Um, and that was a burnout phase, but obviously that continues within depression as well. So, in essence, it's like if somebody doesn't look like they're functioning or doesn't sound as though they're functioning as much then perhaps it will be nice just to ask them, like, how are they? But even before that, I think it's nice to ask, how are you? But anyway, so that's recognising depression. Next slide, please. So how do you then overcome this? How do we make sure that those statistics that I showed you back from 2014 don't continue when you guys are practising doctors and we're practising doctors? Well, I think it kind of all starts with building a good support system. Um, like I said, because Imperial was not very quite diverse when I started, I found this very difficult. But the year group that, because I, I took time out and I came back, and the year group that I'm with now is so much better. Imperial really recognised that they were being really ridiculous with their diversity and inclusion. And so now, you know, it's a lot more diverse, both from like people from different socioeconomic backgrounds, people from different, um, just like different identities, whether that's LGBTQ, whether that's um, I don't like the phrase BAME, but, you know, different minority groups, people from different backgrounds are there now. And I, I think that makes a difference because because it, it's important, like how you relate to somebody um, and the sort of so social network that you build. So I think, yeah, like it all kind of starts with trying to create a network for yourself when you go to university. Like I said, um, I don't have anybody to tell me, oh, like you should join these societies or whatever. I literally had no clue. But top tip would be go along to societies. You might have heard this already, but go along to societies. And, you know, if you don't want to drink, don't drink. They can't force you to drink. There's a, there's a massive culture of alcohol within freshers, um, but you don't have to subscribe to that. And eventually you will find your people, even if it does take some time. Um, but finding your people is really important because it means that you can talk about how you're feeling. And that is so important, just checking in with each other, just checking in, being like, how are you doing today? Like, how are you coping with the workload? How are you coping with moving out from home? How are you coping with having to cook for yourself? Or even if you're not cooking for yourself, how are you coping with money and things like that? Just asking how people are, just keeping that conversation going is so, so important. It's like a protective factor. And we are social beings, right, as humans, like we are social. So um, that's really important. So the second thing is, I think, um, making time to be active. Um, you'll find that people will just like go to the library and stay in the library literally for 24 hours a day. You'll come back the next day and they're still in the same spot, still studying. Not good. You need to be able to, I mean, exercise, you know, you might have had exercise releases those feel good hormones, those endorphins. Um, it just keeps you active but it's not just that it's not just about your health but it's also like just feeling good it's great but also the other thing is that exercise is really really good for memory for helping you remember what you're learning um and so it's really important that you don't take you don't think of going to the gym or whatever exercise you're doing you don't think of that time as being um something that you have to feel guilty about that you're taking time for yourself no self-care is really important Looking after yourself is so important. So that's exercise. The other thing is then just like making sure that you're eating okay. Um, I think particularly in first year, right, everybody is like super stressed with moving out of home for the first time that you you tend to just like eat junk food and you tend to just completely forget about your five a day. 
And it's like, really, you need your brain in order to even just take in all the information that you're learning. You need to be able to, you know, have your nutrients, your vitamins, um, and just your body needs to be able to like deal with it. But eating junk food, that's, that's not, it's not going to be helpful. And yet, because there's so much going on, that's what happens. So I'd really recommend actually, just like in the summer before you go to medical school, um, meal prepping and like learning some recipes and just thinking about like how am I going to work out financially like how am I gonna when am I going to go to the shop to buy and just practice it even with your own house like just be like okay guys for your family I'm gonna do the meal prepping today and I'm gonna cook today it might feel pathetic but trust me when you go to uni you're gonna have to do that so it's much better to have that down in the bag already than go to uni and be like oh this is like yet another thing that I need to do um so um number four drinking sensibly i mean that goes without saying if you do drink just it's again it's strange because i think there's such a massive culture of drinking within medical school um and just at university in general and what is crazy is that you then learn about liver problems and what alcohol does to your body and yet people still drink so much and and it also becomes a social a way of socializing it it's like oh like let's go to the pub or like let's just go I don't know, clubbing or whatever and drink. And that's like the night to remember or whatever. Um, you don't have to make friends like that. You can make friends differently and you can, um, you know, you don't, you set your boundaries basically, whether that's in relationships, whether that's, you know, whatever it is, you set the boundaries. Um, five, keeping in touch, like I said, um, oh, actually this keeping in touch, what I wanted to mention was like keeping in touch with people outside of medical school, I think is as equally important as keeping in touch with people within medical school um so whether that's calling home if you're close to your family or whether that's um keeping in touch with friends from your secondary school um this is something that is it's really strange because at school like at secondary school you're sort of already with a bunch of people from like year seven or maybe like in sixth form that you don't have to think about making friends but um those people that you've, you're with, you might not like them. You might be like, I hate everybody, I can't wait to leave. But if you do have some friends at secondary school, I think it's really nice to be able to keep in touch with them and just see how they're going. Because those people know you um, for longer, I think. Or personally, anyway, I'm still like super close to all my friends from school, so much more than I am with my friends from medical school. So, you know, and also it's just nice to have conversations that are non-medical, particularly like if you have friends who don't do medicine, because otherwise all your conversations just be about medicine, be about like science and patients. And it's nice just to be like theater or like, did you read that book? Or, you know, tell me about this, like geo, like this geography, this like, tell me about your river practical. Do you know what I mean? Like just something completely different. It's really nice to have those conversations. Um, number six, so asking for help. Um, I hope that my, my story kind of illustrated that but basically like I spoke to my personal tutor I spoke to my doctor now speaking to them was so important to me even though I felt like I was going to be kicked out of medical school I was clearly wrong like they gave me the opportunity to be like we just want you to be well we just want you to come back as a well person so you can be a good doctor um and my personal tutor and my senior tutor helped me so much like so so much um I think it's just really it's it's difficult though like because these people are new it's not like at school where you have teachers that you see every day these are just random people that you're supposed to contact via email if you need anything and your lecturers they don't really know you because there's so many of you so you feel like you're a bit of a nobody but it's really important to take that initiative and be like if i'm not doing okay i'm going to reach out and i'm going to speak to someone um and just figure out what your what your university's welfare system is because just welfare is just so important in general Seven, taking a break. I mean, this kind of links back to keeping active. But in terms of studying, right, it, it's so tempting um, to be like, I've got like all these lectures to do. I've got like this massive PBL case I need to unpack. I just don't have time to be taking a break right now. Um, I think with lockdown, it becomes even more important that we take breaks from the screen. But just because it's so much more, literally like scientifically, it, you're so much more effective with um learning and with just functioning if you take breaks if you give your brain time to process to do something else and then come back whether that's going for a walk whether that's doing some photography whether that's drawing whether that's playing an instrument whether that's dancing whatever it is calling someone take breaks uh, the way i like to do it now is that i'll like study with like in like hour chunks and i'll take like 15 minute breaks hour 15 minutes 
And if I need more time to take a break, I will take a bit more time because it's important that you listen to your body. It's important that you, you know, you check in with how you're feeling. Um, because forcing yourself to study just is not going to be productive and then you're going to feel worse about it. So, yeah. And this also goes for like your exams right now, like for um, your mock exams or I don't know how they're going to do it this year, but have that they're doing it. Do take breaks. Um, number eight, doing something you're good at. I think this is funny. Um, it's not funny, but it's also funny because you kind of get to medical school and everybody feels like they're no longer good at anything even though you're clearly good at something that's why you've like you're here but you know you go you do it so much like you you do so much medicine but you feel like there's so much that you don't know that you feel like you're just not good at anything anymore like that everything is and I have to I have to watch myself because for example like last week I was with I was on placement I was on a ward round and the doctor was asking me a question and I just couldn't remember the answer and I was like oh god like I'm so bad da, da, da. but I've got to I've got to make sure that I, I listen to myself speaking like that and I go no David you know what that's not true if we don't know something we go and we learn it we repeat the learning because medicine is a process of repeated learning you you learn so much that you it's it's inevitable that you're going to forget it so you have to keep learning but it's important that you kind of top up your self-esteem as it were so like doing something that you do feel good at um that do helps you feel good is important um uh, number nine, accepting who you are. I think this is very broad. This is this is whether you know. This is not just like, for example, for me personally, this was effect, this was accepting that I was a refugee or accepting that I came from a particular background. But I know, like for example, for some of my friends, it might be like accepting that they are gay or accepting that they are going through a difficult time right now. It's just sort of accepting or like going through illness right now, accepting that. Um, things are changing it's just sort of being at one with yourself and I think that that takes time it takes time and it takes self-discipline to be like I am going to take my take some time out for myself today I don't have to study like 7 a.m to 12 p.m 12 um, a.m sorry and then go to bed like it, it it just that process of checking in whether that's doing meditation or yoga whatever it is it's really really important um because if not then it will affect other things but anyway, in the last 10, no, number 10, caring for other people. I think just this kind of goes back to number one, actually, about talking about your feelings. I think when we're there for each other, we we develop this bond and this like sense of um, like protection, as it were. And I think, you know, when you just do something for somebody else, it's just really nice and you feel a bit better about it. Um, so, yeah, those are my top tips for just like looking after yourself. Um, I hope that was that was OK. Next slide, please. Um, so just that last slide, really. So this is just on how do you. So the question that I was I was asked to address was basically like, how like can I apply to medical school if I've gone through an illness myself, particularly like a mental illness or if I'm going through something at the moment? Um, and I wanted to put up this quote, which is only the wounded physician heals. I love this quote so much. And it basically what I want to say is like. Please don't feel. Um, what's the word like please don't feel disencouraged disencouraged unencouraged I don't know what the word is basically apply anyway um what I'm trying to say is that if you've gone through a health problem whether that's mental whether that's physical right you are going to be able to relate to your patients so much more and that actually means that you're going to be like an amazing doctor because you have like that personal experience um and we need more doctors who really do understand their patients because otherwise you just learn science you just become a robot unless you're like you know empathetic so I really love this quote because it's like yeah like it's only if you're wounded yourself that you can actually like begin to feel what another person being wounded is like and you can begin to like actually help them so um but one thing I would do want to say though um is that you guys might have heard of the GMC which is the general medical council they kind of like the, the people that oversee all the universities all the doctors all the medical universities and all the doctors. Um, now, what the GMC basically says is that if you're ill, particularly if you're mentally, if you have a mental illness or if you're going through depression or something, that's completely fine. But you have to make sure that you are seeking the help. You have to be, at the end of the day, what matters is that you're a safe doctor. So if it means that, you know, you're 
um, because you're so unwell, you can no longer provide the right care for your patients. That is dangerous. At that point, okay, you you will need to take time out. But and at that point, the GMC might be like, okay, we need to review whether this patient, this person can continue being a doctor just for the time being, because if they're not safe, then that's not a good thing, right? So instead of what the GMC says is that it's just really, really important that students, medical students are supported if they're going through a mental health difficulty. Um, and that's not just mental health difficulty, but also just different abilities. So for example, like whether that's dyslexia or whatever else that needs support or ADHD, for example, um, that you're given that support. You can't be discriminated um, as a result of that. And actually at medical school, there's something called occupational health, where um, if you declare that like, um, for example, like, what was it? I, I remember like a friend of mine, um, I think she has dyslexia. And so she just needs some more time in exams to um, sit the exam to read and things like that. Um, where does occupational health come into this? I remember she went to occupational health basically. Um, and what they do is they just kind of assess the, the situation and they're like, do we need to put some adjustments in place just to make sure that you can function okay? Um, and that's really great, right? So the support services are basically available there and the GMC just expects you to reach out and to be um, responsible almost for your own well-being. So as long as um, you are honest with yourself and that you reach out, things will be okay. So essentially all I wanna say just to kind of finish off is medical school, yeah, sure, it's tough, but like life is tough and like anything can happen at any moment, anything can happen at any point. Um, those figures that I showed, they're scary, but they don't need to continue like that. And actually we are seeing a difference in the welfare of medical students and of doctors as a result of like, us breaking the stigma um, and because we're talking about it, because we're talking about how to look after yourself, how to look after one another. And so I really just hope that this talk um, has helped you kind of feel a bit more empowered to A, talk about your own um, feelings and your own emotions, and also to, um, to reach out for help when needed, whether that's at school, you might be going through something right now, or whether that's like 12 years down the line when you're, I don't know, applying for um, your speciality choices or something like when you're choosing where which kind of doctor you want to be um, just make sure that at every point that you check in with somebody that you're looking after yourself and that you're keeping well because at the end of the day if you can't if you if you're not able to look after yourself you can't be there for your patients and so it goes hand in hand looking after yourself comes first you've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can put it on, on anyone else so I will end it there um, I think the last slide is just um just saying thank you and good luck and my twitter and my instagram hashtag is there and feel free to email me if you if you want to talk about anything um but yeah happy to take any questions i hope that wasn't i hope that was okay no it was really really good thank you so much and um the mentees slash attendees are posting such nice messages to support you and are oh, also definitely. saying like please take care of yourself and everyone love yourself. I'm rooting for you guys, et cetera, which is super nice to read. Oh, that's so, so sweet. Thank yeah. you so, so much for opening up. I know it's not easy because there's loads of stigma on mm. similar topics and it is very hard to open up and to, to admit that us, you know, which sometimes have the superhero complex of always having to be at our best. Yeah. Um, sometime aren't. So thank yeah. you so, so much. Yeah. Um, I guess some questions that have come through, mm -hmm. for example, what can you do if you have self-destructive slash self-sabotaging thoughts, like you're not good enough or you're not smart enough to apply to medical school? Okay. So uh, that's such a good question. And I'm really sorry um, if you're feeling like that, if you're feeling like that. I think I would just take a step back and think, why am I feeling like this? Um, is there something going on already? And actually going, you know what I mentioned about CBT? There are lots of um, online CBT things available um, to kind of break that cycle. It takes time, you have to really work on it. Um, but I want to say like, look at where you are now, right? Um, you are capable of getting in, you are capable of doing it. But in terms of, um, I, but I, I feel like 
self-sabotaging talks in relation to medical school might not just be in relation to medical school it might just be in general self-sabotaging thoughts and self-destructive thoughts and actually that for me indicates a bigger problem and a problem that needs to be addressed um either with a doctor or with a counselor or a psychologist or something so i would say try try some cbt like just have a look at some cbt techniques online it might i feel like i don't want to give like bad advice um but cbt is really really helpful but i just think if you're feeling negative if you're having these negative talk thoughts it's really important that you learn to um that all of us really learn to kind of change the way that we think so that we we are kinder towards ourselves and we're more loving towards ourselves because we deserve to be right it's such a difficult place to live in in your head if you're always hating yourself or always thinking oh i just can't do this um and so it's about rewiring those thoughts and cbt and things like that can really help thank you next up we have apart from so many to that you're amazing etc which oh, i think are them. so true um, and I think that this is so beneficial for medical students themselves because we know how tough it is. Um, and also, thank you so much for this talk. This has encouraged me to have more faith in going into medicine, um, which I think is very true. But yeah, next question. If you already have depression and anxiety, would it be wise to apply to medicine? And this kind of ties in with another question, which is, do you think it's wise to apply to medicine if I feel like I already have depression and anxiety, but then I feel like if I give up on the idea of getting into medical school, then I give up on everything that, you know, I've thought of and I've dreamed mm. of? Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. Like, please apply. I mean, I, like I was saying in my last slide, if you just, can you just go back a slide for a second? Um, kind of what I was saying was basically guys if you're going through something right now okay like first of all I just think it's really important that you get the help that you need um I know that sometimes not all your doctors are actually supportive and that might mean talking to a different doctor and it might really mean fighting your case um because sometimes you just have these such awful experiences and you end up like just not trusting anybody and not feeling like you can open up but it's really important that you do just like it's so it might it's so difficult i do appreciate that but it is really important that you do you know try to find the help um and confide in somebody um so that's part one which is actually looking after yourself first the second thing like i said with this quote is that you as young people who are going through something because you know the difficulty of life you will be able to relate to your patients so much more like this is literally what i found coming back to medical school having gone through my experience i'm like this is crazy like i actually get now why a patient might feel like this or you know you just you feel it a bit more you you understand it a bit more and that actually means that you know you'll really be able to relate to your patients you'll really be able to like provide better support for them and care for them and so if anything you know your experiences is an is an advantage as, as much as it's awful to go through what you're going through right now in the long run like you will be such a better doctor as a result of it but i just think what i do want to like signpost and say is that if you're going through something i'd really advise taking a gap year before um you can apply to medical now but just defer your entry just because medical school is so so stressful i'm just being honest okay it is stressful i think we'll all agree it's stressful you cope, you learn to cope, you learn to be okay, you learn to be all right, but it's stressful. And I don't want that additional stress to kind of worsen something you're feeling already. And so it might be a good idea to just take some time out and um, work through your own emotions, learn to like manage yourself a bit better so that when you come to medical school, you're equipped with like the psychological toolkit, kind of like the first aid box to, um, cope with the stresses the additional stresses of medical school um and there's nothing wrong with taking time out i just want to emphasize that as well whether that's taking a gap year or taking time out whilst you're at university when i took a time out i took time out it was such a new concept like i had never heard of anybody taking time out so i was like i just felt like a massive failure for doing that but actually it was the best thing that i could have ever done because 
I am now so much more, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well again. And like, that makes so much of a difference, you know, doing medical school whilst you're well, just like living life when you're well is so much better than living life when you're ill. So, um, yeah, taking time out is really important. So I'd say get help, take time out before medical school, please apply to medical school. Like you're going to be amazing. So yeah, don't let that ever, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Discourage you. That's the word I'm looking for. Discourage you from applying. Sorry. Yeah. And I agree with everything you said, and particularly with the concept that only the wounded physician heals. And to be fair, guys, just think about like, I don't know, if you go to the doctor and they're like, oh, you really need to stop smoking. If they stink like cigarettes, you're going to say like, oh, wow, you are telling me that like, I need to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. But if you say something like, you really need to stop smoking. And I have a problem with that as well. And I think we both should do it. It feels like you're not just giving suggestions just for just like patients can trust you because because they feel like you know what they're going through. Um, yeah. And I think I really got to learn about this when um, when I went to a lecture by somebody that calls himself the wounded healer and he's a psychiatrist. Yes. He's so good. Um, he is so good. And I suggest you guys check him out on Twitter because he does a lot of this work. We only have time for one more question. Um, Can you just go to the next slide? Sorry, just say so that they have my contact details. On that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yeah, go we on. only have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, but guys, please, so many of you have written that they're feeling low. Um, mm. And I feel like... I'm so sorry, we can't get to your question and to your specific case due to time constraint, but please get in touch with somebody that can help you. If you're having yeah. thoughts of harming yourself, if you feel like life is not worth living anymore, like, sorry, this got very sad, but um, yeah, we are gonna take one more question and then Lee is gonna say something regarding a gap year to finish. Yeah, so, I was gonna say, um, if what we'll do is, well, this week we'll post some stuff about mental health some resources for you guys. Yeah um because i know that lockdown's been tough on everyone yeah so we'll definitely we'll definitely do it this week i'll make sure of it so do you think that. it's a good idea to talk our mental health experiences um, during an interview or our own personal statement um a fantastic question i just want to address what you just said about lots of people posting or like messaging that they're feeling low i'm really really sorry to hear that guys like lockdown like you said like it's been really tough on everybody um and for some people more than others for various reasons, whether that's financial or relationship or whatever it is. Um, like Anna has already said, um, I would really just recommend keeping, like being open with somebody that you can trust. And um, like Samaritan's Helpline is so good. Um, Mind Charity are really, really good as well to call. Um, keeping in touch with one another even if it's via like I know zoom is just not the best in terms of like zoom calls or whatever but even just keeping in touch and just calling somebody and speaking to them is really really important and try if you can just go for walks um even if exercise feels like it's too much physical energy go for walks um just to keep active and look after yourselves I'm really sorry I wish I could like I wish this was like a real actual lecture so we could like talk and whatever I could like give you guys some tips or whatever but um yeah so sorry the question was can I talk about my experiences of mental health in my personal statement or in my interview my personal advice would be if it's something that has made you reflect and therefore made you become a doctor made you understand what the experience of being a patient is like then absolutely feel free to talk about it um and the same with your interview you know um I was coaching somebody for interview the other week and I was like you know, you can talk about what it's like to be a patient. In fact, that is the most valuable thing. Um, more than I love science and I want to help people. It's like, I know what it's like to be a patient. I know the struggle. I know what it's like to have to go to the doctor, have to keep these health appointments all the time. And my health, my whole life just revolve around appointments and, you know, doctors and whatever. And so I think it's a real advantage so if you can spin it like that then I think absolutely feel free to talk about it and feel free to talk about how much the stigma is affecting people and how much 
mental illness because people don't talk about it it can manifest as a physical symptom you know like people present with like they can't breathe and it's like we go through all the tests for why they can't breathe and it turns out they can't breathe because they're having panic attacks rather than they have asthma or they have copd or other respiratory conditions you know so that the psychological part of things is so important and it's becoming clearer and clearer that we need to talk about that a lot more so yeah like absolutely talk about it guys and wish you all good luck Sorry, go on. Sorry, real quick. Um, I just really wanted to say uh, two things. Um, a gap year, like for me, like the gap year really helped because in year 13, you're doing so many things. You're doing your UCAT, your UCAS, your personal statement, your UCAT, your BMA, then you revise for mocks and it just doesn't end. So by the time you come to year 13, or at least when I came to year 13, I just wasn't ready. Like your mind is physically blown and I think like regardless of uh, and believe it or not like I was so anti-gap year I was like what the hell would I do for a year like um why would anyone want a gap year and if I had to go back I would say if everyone does something before med school I would say take a gap year just med school is six years and I'm first year at Imperial and you just don't want to come tired like you want that pit where you can just relax and then just really like find who you are I know this sounds like really cringe but like just to know what you enjoy because most of the days you study as you were saying and it's so easy to get stuck at your desk nine to five and you just need to be like Lee hey you like doing this time to get out and it helps so much and I speak to like people who d- who did last year, like who didn't take gap year, and they say it's never ending. Yeah. And on yeah. sorry, on, on my second point, um, with regards to interviews, I would say if you're happy to talk about your mental health, by all means do it. But like if you haven't dealt with it, or if you is if it's gonna trigger your interview, and if it if you think you can't confidently. Or if you're going to get upset, maybe like don't trigger yourself into like saying it, like try and if you can like project your points nicely across, go for it. But like if it still triggers you, try maybe like not to trigger yourself because interviews are so stressful, especially doing MMI and constantly moving around. And that's the only thing is once you have like a negative four, it's really hard to knock your negative thoughts out. Um, yeah and remember talk to your parents as well your parents teachers and support especially at Imperial so I'm first year so the whole course has really changed so now we get so much support we have like academic meetings every other week sometimes it's a bit too much but like the support is nice and the course has a lot I think the course changed between mine and your year and it's really like um, you really feel more involved but yeah. to be honest like I everything you said today is so applicable to my life so <sighs> like even as a med student I think it's so important you listen to this like I'll, I'll probably like go back and rewatch this like guess <laughs> another time because it was so good for me anyway but yes oh, thank you yeah, bless you no yeah thank you for sharing um I think you made mention a really important point about just ensuring that you're not triggered um uh just also with with regards to like finding out what what you enjoy um I literally like I had danced all my life but when I came to uni there wasn't the society available for the type of dancing I did so I did Bharatanatyam and there wasn't like a Bharatanatyam society at uni I couldn't set one up in first year like in first year there's so much going on already that you just can't set one up so then when I during my time out so I felt like I had all these hobbies but I wasn't really like the right place to go for it and so in my time out um during second and third year um I picked picked up the cello and so now I I play the cello and it's literally like what I go to like during my breaks and it really helps so like Lee said like just finding things that you enjoy taking that time out um just to balance and also there's no rush with medical school that's I think it's really important to mention because it's six years sure but then after that you've still got so many years ahead of you and people take time out after medical school before they become a junior doctor and even when they're a junior doctor they take time out before they decide which type of doctor they want to be um you have people that go on holiday people that um do a master's or you know do other things so 
there's really no rush at all. Um, your parents might say otherwise, but really, you know, there's like, take it from us, there's no rush at all. Um, in fact, the graduate medics honestly set, tend to like do medicine so much better just because they have their life together. Like they know themselves and they know like how to cope with things. So um, yeah, anyway, good luck. And um, I'll hand it back to Anna. And thank you for listening as well. Thank you all, that was really great. So mental health is very important and that's why we're giving you a little break because we don't want you guys to be so tired from our conference that you're just gonna be like, no, I don't wanna apply to medicine anymore. But as always in the break, uh, we have our codes, the pre-conference form, the Google reviews, um, write us a nice comment if you're enjoying the day and we will have the last talk of the day in about five, six, seven minutes, just so that everyone has drunk some water, stretch your legs. We don't want you to have DBT or anything. So yeah, and come back, of course. Actually just leave the YouTube open, but stretch your legs, okay guys? And we will be back.
Okay, so welcome back everyone. Um, hopefully you will add a good break. Once again, sorry for not being able to get through all of your questions. Um, it's great to see how engaged you guys are. Um, however, unfortunately, we just simply don't have enough time. But once again, if you're feeling low or if you're feeling like you're not yourself, please get in touch with somebody that can help you and provide the help you need, okay? So we've now come to the last talk of the day called Rejected by All Medical Schools. What happens next? And here we will have a pre-recorded video by Izzy and we will have a live talk by Rabi uh, who took a gap year. So first of all, we have a video for you guys about the graduate pathway to medicine, which will start playing now. And Charms, maybe you didn't share your audio. Uh oh. Okay, let me stop sharing and then. Yeah, then share again. Yeah. Share sound. Oh. Okay. My name is Hannah and I'm Welfare Officer for Intermed School and today we have Izzy, um, who's a medic at Warwick and she's just going to have a talk with us today about basically what happens if your medical application doesn't go quite to plan. So Izzy, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, so please tell us a bit more about your own personal journey into med school. So, um, basically, it was it was a challenging journey. Um, it took me around four attempts to get into med school. So I'm currently a graduate medic at the University of Warwick, but the first time I applied was about six years ago at A level. So I applied to four unis, four unis for undergraduate, and I applied to medical sciences at Exeter. Um, as the alternative choice but you know I, I submitted the application and to be honest at the time I didn't really have like you know I, I was like yeah I just submit the application I didn't really have much knowledge around what I was doing but I, I just kind of did it anyway if you get what I mean yeah. but um so I submitted it and I was like really enthusiastic and then throughout the year I just saw all these rejections just coming my way I was like one two three four and then like all rejections and I was really really upset like I remember there was times where I was crying and stuff like it was just awful and then I just couldn't really understand why and then I then the thing is the reason I chose Exeter was because they were offering a transfer into med medicine course but I said that you know what I'll get my three A's at the time it was like you needed three A's to get in to medicine so I was like I'll get my three A's and then I'll you know go and then I'll take a gap year and reapply. But results day came now and I got AAB and I was just like, you know, those are really good grades, but like the B just wasn't good enough for like, you know, for the taking a gap year. So I just kind of was like, I'm going to go to Exeter. They're offering a transfer to medicine in the first year of the degree of the course. So I was like, I'm going to do that. So I went to Exeter and then I did like, they said you have to be in the top 10% of the year to get in to to get an interview. So I did that. I worked really hard throughout the year and then I got an interview and then didn't get a place. So then now I felt like I was just stuck on this degree that mm. I, I didn't really plan to do. Like the reason I went there was for medicine, but I kind of just, you know, I just decided I was going to continue and apply for graduate. So, you know, that's two times I tried to get into medicine. I didn't do, didn't get in. And then at the end of my, in the final year of my degree, I reapplied for medicine, but this time I applied um, for three graduate courses and an undergraduate course and an undergraduate course, which was like semi, um, it was like semi in, like internal because I was already at Exeter doing medical sciences. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't get any of my graduate offers, three graduate offers rejected. And then um, I got an offer at Exeter, but because financially I couldn't afford it because you know when you've done one degree you don't get full like you don't get funding for a second degree if yeah. it's another undergraduate degree 
So I just like I couldn't see a way around that. And I had other personal reasons as well. So I had to withdraw my application and then I reapplied again. And finally got an offer from Warwick. So I reapplied to four graduate unis and got an offer from Warwick. But I do talk more about like my journey into med school on my YouTube channel. So you should check that out. But yeah, I go into a lot more I got go into a bit more detail about it. Um but yeah, it was it was a challenge and I was just like, you know when you're just so tired and you're like, Why do I keep failing? Why is it not working? And there was times where I was like, I don't want to do medicine anymore throughout that journey. There was honestly times where I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and then there were times that like, I had like a boost of motivation. So it was challenging, but I just kept pushing and I eventually got there in the end. And like, honestly, when people say like, what's your biggest achievement? Like, I know it sounds cliche, but I'm like getting into medicine because I know how much I work to get here. So yeah, that's just a summary of my journey, like in a nutshell. <laughs> Honestly, that is a massive achievement from like everything that you had to go through. But um, how would you say you made the most of your time while you were in Exeter after you felt like you were trapped on the course? So I did like I spent a bit of time like oh, sulking, feeling sorry for myself. Um, but I was like, you know what, Issy, you're on this degree now. Like if you if you drop out, like you don't really know I didn't really know what else I was going to do so I decided I was just going to continue and like get involved in things so I started getting involved in societies so I got involved in um, ACS which is African Caribbean Society so I got involved in being in the committee I also um, you know joined medical leadership and management society so I was just getting involved in different things I was going to different conferences I was going to conferences as well like going to like events that the uni would hold about like the medical course or like and shadowing getting involved in shadowing as well so sh shadowing doctors um when the opportunities came I also worked as a healthcare assistant just to get more experience and I I did some volunteering so I was like an academic coach for um a student a pupil as well just for a couple of months so I got myself just like involved and I also did things that I enjoyed too like it wasn't just you know, not everything I did was centered around medicine. I got myself involved in things I wanted to do. So a bit of sporting, athletics. Um, I just I just decided I was just gonna make take the full opportunity, spending time with friends, just like enjoying the enjoying the the process really. Um, and how would you say you kept yourself motivated then during all of this to stay on the goal of medicine? Oh, oh, I'm not gonna lie. The the motivation part, <laughs> the motivation part. It was it was like it it dipped. It went up and it dipped. Like it was up and down. But like overall, I did stay motivated. And I think um, a, a lot, like quite a bit of it, was to do with the fact that I was like who I was surrounded by. So you know, I was with people on my degree who were also on a similar journey. Like my friends were also on a similar journey. They were all wanting to do medicine or not, not just medicine, but people that wanted to do some, like that were working towards a goal that, you know, didn't get in the first time or were trying again. So, you know, I had people to like talk to and to encourage me. And like, for those who d might not have that, like who might not have that system around them, I also think it's important to like, you know, that's right. Like, what do you, what do you watch? What do you read? That, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So, watching people on YouTube or like following people on social media that are doing what you want to do. So you like, you have your eye on the goal. I think that that was really important for me was that I was surrounded by people and I was like, you know, sort of like the energy around me. I don't know how to explain it in like a straightforward way, but, you know, having people around me or, you know, looking for people online or on social media, doing what you want to do, that can really help with motivation. And also, like, I guess I didn't, there was a point where I was like, Issy, not everything about you is just medicine. Like, I think there was a point where I was like, everything you do is medicine, medicine. And I, I was like, there's more to you than just the medicine. So I think that's something that motivated me was realising and accepting that, you know, okay, I want to be a doctor, but there's so much more about me. I'm getting involved in different things. I'm getting involved in ACS. I'm reading this or I'm doing this or I'm helping someone or I'm volunteering. Like, 
getting involved in other things outside of medicine and doing things that you enjoy, whether that's spending time with friends or like the little things so that like I didn't get wrapped up in like, so I didn't lose my motivation was just getting involved in things I enjoyed really. That really helped with my motivation. Um, and yeah, people like looking, looking to people on social media, whether, whether that's YouTube, that helped me as well. Um, I don't know if you've watched Ollie Burton. Um, he goes oh, to no, Warwick. I don't think I've seen him. Yeah, but he, he like there's there's quite a few people like there's quite a lot of people on YouTube that are doctors and they just document what they do and that sort of thing thing kept me motivated as well. Just like watching people, just their day to day, that kept me going. Like it kept my eye on the ball. But yeah, it's it, a lot of it is to do with you know making sure that um, with motivation, making sure that you don't just focus on medicine and making sure you're doing things that you enjoy as well and taking a break. Like I took lots of breaks from thinking about the application. I took lots of breaks from just like trying to do things towards my application as well. Whether it was just, just doing me not thinking about medicine, that really helped. Um, so I didn't get like sucked into it. Yeah. Wow. So a lot goes into like maintaining the positive mindset, I guess. Um, but you managed it um uh and then in retrospect what do you wish you knew before applying to medicine the first time round? oh like I wish that <laughs> I wish that I knew more about the process I think I did not do much research I didn't like I knew I wanted to be a doctor but I think one of the most important things when you go to applying is having insight and in retrospect, I think that I lacked that. Um, so, for instance, I kind of, like, didn't know what was what I was doing in terms of the entrance exam. So the UK CAT, it was called the UK CAT when I took it. Um, so the UK CAT, uh, I just kind of, like, did it. I didn't really prepare properly for it. And, like, when I got my results, I kind of, like, regretted. Like, I kind of regretted it because I was like, you didn't really... I was like, oh, Issy, you could have worked so much harder for this. But at the time, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to do the UCAT, but I didn't really understand fully what I was doing. And I think it's so important that when you go into, like, when I when you go into like, medicine and when you go into the application process, you know exactly what you're doing. Like, it helps so much. And the thing is, when I did get this um, low UCAT score, I then didn't apply tactfully. So I just, I think I was very... I was like, okay, I've got my UCAT now. I'm just going to apply. So I think I applied. Where do I, I can't really remember. I think I applied to like Oxford Imperial, Leeds, and oh, I can't remember where else. I think it was like Birmingham. There's always that one I just can't remember. <laughs> but um, I applied to these places with my UCAT score, but it wasn't it wasn't what they were looking for. And looking back, I would have used my UCAT score to apply to places that were um, more accepting of lower scores and we're looking at other things on your application. And when I took the BMAT as well, I didn't really um, understand the BMAT. Like, I didn't have the full understanding. So, again, I applied to um, Oxbridge, but I didn't really, like, I didn't think I did enough research into doing well enough in the BMAT to apply to Oxbridge. I think that, yeah, I wasn't, I, w I wasn't very tactful, and that really impacted my application. Um Definitely research was a big thing for me. It was one of the big factors of not knowing what to do, like not getting in. And I think another thing was um, I didn't really know what my options were when it came to not getting in. So, you know, I didn't I didn't get into medicine, which is like which is fine. But at the same time, I didn't look at my what my options were like. I just sort of said, OK, now I've got Exeter, I'm going to go to Exeter and I'm going to transfer. I didn't look at other routes I could have taken, which which is like, obviously I'm here now and it's amazing and I'm really happy, but I wish that I kind of knew and, you know, had a look at all my options before I went, like, went into doing an undergraduate degree. So I could have looked at whether I was eligible for widening participation or foundation, foundation year courses and things like that. Um, but I didn't look at those things. I kind of just didn't really have a clue. And I think then again, that comes down to to research. Like I, I didn't do much research. I didn't have much insight. Um, I think looking back now, I'm a lot more mature and I'm really happy that I got in when I did because I've learned so much from my experience and 
you know, working in all these places, and working during my gap year as well, I've, I've learned so much. Um, and yeah, in retrospect, definitely researching and knowing exactly what to do, exactly where to apply for, would have increased my chances. And not even that, it just would have meant that I had more insight into like the life of a doctor and things like that. So yeah. Okay, um, so we've had some great advice from you so far that I'm sure our mentees will definitely take on board. Um, but do you have any other words of wisdom in general for our students who maybe don't succeed on the first time round? Um, I think that when you don't succeed in the first time round, it's one thing I'd say is that it's you. it will feel quite personal. And I knew I took it quite personally and I took it I was like oh my gosh it's it's me it's I'm the problem but the thing is when you apply it's it's and you don't get in it's it's not personal because they don't know you they just have 500 words or 4,000 characters on you they have some grades they have your name your date of birth and things like that but they haven't really seen you they haven't met you and they have so many applications they have to get through so one of the things I'd say is when you don't when you don't get in at first it will feel quite quite personal but try not to take it personally just because you don't get in the first time does not mean you're not worth being a doctor does not mean that you're not going to be a great doctor and it doesn't mean that you're not going to get in in the future. Um, I think it, that was one of the things that I did when I when I applied at first and did, got these rejections I took it personally and I was just like oh it's me it's me it means I'm not going to be a good doctor it means I'm not going to get there but. Like one thing I'd say is do not let it deter you from where you want to get to. Um, it's it's very easy to take it personally, but try not to, because if you think about it, they have thousands of applications and um, they've got so much to get through. And like, you know, it's it's not a personal thing if you don't get in the first time. Honestly, it's not. It's, it's just that it didn't happen. But then you need to take it as an opportunity. There's my other word of advice. Take it as an opportunity to learn. So I think one good thing that you should do is, OK, I've not gotten in and it really hurts. Take as an opportunity, first of all, process your emotions and make sure, you know, you like, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to process everything and take your time to feel. But then also it's a good opportunity for you to learn from your application. So look at your application. OK, what were my strong points? What did I do well and what can I work on? And if, if you can seek advice from people get opinions from people about what you could improve on your application. So for instance, maybe you didn't get much experience and you didn't have much insight into being a doctor. Um, use this time, maybe if you're taking a gap year or going on to another degree, use this time to like be like, okay, I'm gonna get some experience. Okay, I don't have much, much experience. So I'm gonna use this time to build myself and to learn more about being a doctor and to understand more about medicine, to read more, because I think like it's it's very important to do that because I like one of the big things for me was having all that time and my degree and all that it was that I had time to like get involved in things I had time to like get involved in societies get experience and the thing is at the time I didn't think I was doing that much but then when it came to writing my personal statement I realized that I had so much like I had so much to put in and I think that's one thing that's really important is that you use your time to elevate yourself and I think it's really a good opportunity to take a pause and get to know yourself. I think this was a really big thing for me in my gap year after my first degree was that I had time to work, but then I also had a bit more time to spend time with myself. And I think, you know, when you're in education, you could always, you're always going for that one thing. You're always going for something. What well, you get one thing, you're always working towards something, but use it as an opportunity to like, you know, get to know yourself, get to know what you enjoy, get to know what you don't enjoy. And, you know, to get experience and really learn about, um, you know, what it's like to be, be a doctor and also learn about whether you actually want to do this. I think that's very important is that you get experience, not just not just to like, OK, so so now I have the experience, but also to see, OK, do I actually enjoy this? Is this actually something I would want to do? Um, use it as a time to reflect. And also, I'd say another word of advice, if you, if you don't get in, is to remember that to celebrate your achievements. Like, I think sometimes I I do I've done this, but I forget the things that I do like I did do and the things that I did achieve. I didn't get into medicine, but 
I got good A levels. I got AAB, which is great. You know, I got into university, which is amazing. It might not be the the course I want, but I got into university. University said I want you to come. Like even you know finishing a book, I think sometimes we forget to celebrate our small achievements, and I think it's really important that we do. I mean, you might not get into medicine, but it doesn't mean that you won't get in. Just keep going and keep pushing. Um, it's kind of scary because you may not know when you're going to do it, but trust me, you will get there. There was times where I think, where I thought, I'm not getting into medicine, like, but, you know, I'm here now. And I think a lot of that had to do with me just taking time to pause and celebrate my little achievements and, you know, getting all that experience really helped my application. So that's my extra words of advice. <laughs> Thank you so much. And finally, how are you finding um, your university so far? University, do you know what? I'm really enjoying the process, but at the same time, it's it's difficult. It's actually quite difficult. The volume of content is a lot, um, <laughs> especially now with like the lockdown and studying online. To be honest, I'm finding it quite hard with motivation and stuff. I think it's because, you know, you're not getting that full experience of uni because everything is through teams. But yeah, um, I'm so happy that I'm here. Like it's sometimes I have to pinch myself and be like, am I actually on the medical course? Like, did I actually get here? But, you know, it's a nice feeling, but it's definitely challenging. Um, I'm, I'm learning a lot about myself and about the way I learn. Um, I feel like, you know, with all this content, it's forcing me to learn in new ways. Is forcing me to be more efficient with my learning, definitely. But I'm definitely enjoying it. But yeah, it's definitely challenging with the, the current circumstances, trying to learn everything online and engage with the learning. Okay, um, well, I guess this is the end of the talk. Thank you so much for taking the time um, to partner with Intermed School today. And we'll make sure to share the link to your YouTube channel with our mentees so they can hopefully um, find some more good content there. Um, and yeah, I guess this is the end. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Hi, my name is Hannah and I'm... Thank you so much. We now have Rabia, who is one of our regional heads, who will talk to us about the things you can do when you take a gap year and why you might decide to do so. Take it away. So, hello everybody, my name is Rabia and I am a first year medical student at the Holyoke Medical School and I'm also a regional head for HIMSS. And today I'm going to be talking about sort of if you are rejected from medical school the first time around and you decide to take a gap year, the things you can do in order to strengthen your application the second time and also sort of my experience as well. So um, next slide, please, thank you. And um, so I think the first thing I definitely want to stress is if you are rejected, don't see it as a reflection of you and your qualities. I think this has already been mentioned, but medicine, the application process, it is very competitive and things don't always go to plan, but that's okay. There are many other options and sort of taking a gap here is just one of them. So yeah, don't let the sort of fact that you've might have been rejected put you off from reapplying and yeah so don't be upset for too long and also I think another really important thing I'd say is reflecting on your reasons for taking a gap year so what reflection includes is sort of looking back at the situation and acknowledging the things that perhaps went well what perhaps didn't go so well and what you've learned from it, I think that's the most important thing. So what you've learned from your experience applying the first time and how you can change it in order to sort of benefit yourself the second time around. And everybody will have sort of different year, uh, different reasons for reapplying. So some people may be sort of focusing on their exam results and resetting exams to get the grades. Some may have already got the grades and be wanting to focus on their personal statement and getting an interview and some might be focusing on their performance interview so everybody's got different reasons and you've got to ask yourself what are you going to do differently this time around that perhaps you didn't the first time 
and university. So ask yourself if you were applying to your strengths the first time around. I think this has already been mentioned as well, but I, I know for me personally, the first time I applied, I didn't really apply to my strengths. So all like every university will look at your application in a, in a different way. Some may mark your personal statements, some may not, some may uh, give a lot of weight to the UCAT score, some may not, some may look at GCSEs. So really research the universities you're applying to and look at whether your application sort of fits them. Um, and sort of when I reapplied, I did apply strategically and I managed to get sort of four offers. So that shows that if you are applying to your strengths, it can really work in your favor. And another thing just to bear in mind is that not all universities will accept research. So if you are resetting your exams, definitely it's worth having a look at whether the universities actually do accept research. I think there's only a couple that don't, but it's definitely worth checking with them just so you aren't sort of wasting um, a space on your application. Thank you. And this sort of links to the point of about reflecting, but so after you've decided or reflected on the reasons for taking a gap year, plan according to the reason you're taking it. So I know for me personally, at the beginning of my gap year, I sort of felt really overwhelmed and sort of the prospect of having a whole year out of um, education and I had to like do loads of things it was very daunting so um, I sort of made a plan it doesn't have to be set in stone it doesn't have to be you know a really rigid plan that can't be changed just sort of a loose structure that can keep you on track so you know the things that you'd like to achieve and yeah it'll help you stay focused and ask yourself what skills you want to focus on improving during your gap year. So this can sort of link to your personal statement. If you know that you've mentioned a lot about perhaps teamwork skills in your personal statement and not a lot about leadership, that might be something you want to focus on. So you might plan your activities during your gap year around leadership skills, if that's what you're wanting to focus on or any other skills. And self-reflection, this is also very important just for sort of yourself and it can help you at interview and in your personal statement as well. But asking yourself or perhaps like keeping a little diary about things that you've learned as a result of your different experiences during your gap year. And yes, it can be helpful to mention um, at interview. And discipline. I think this is a really important thing that I kind of struggled with at the start because you aren't in school. So you don't have the routine of sort of going into school, being told what to do. And you are having to take a lot more responsibility for yourself and for your own learning and planning what you need to do. So, yeah, a lot of discipline is required. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now I'm just going to talk about sort of ways you can boost your application. Some of the things I'm I know that I've mentioned might be a hard to do sort of during the pandemic and with lockdown, but I think there are still things that you are able to do. So I think it's really important to go and actively seek these opportunities. So this again will be individual for every person. If you know that perhaps the first time around you didn't mention enough about voluntary work, your gap year will be the perfect opportunity to go out and gain more experience like volunteering. So things you can do, I know in my sort of local community, because sort of half of my gap year was taken up by lockdown as well. So I just looked at what was going on in my local community. And I know that food banks were still requiring volunteers to sort of, uh, you know, package up the food parcels. And Age UK, they also had a sort of phone, telephone service where you could call an elderly service, service user and just sort of chat to them um, every week or so. So just see what's going on and see what you can do despite lockdown and despite sort of this situation. And yeah, definitely go out and actively seek these opportunities. Ask around, see what's going on, because if you ask somebody and they don't know, chances are they might know somebody that will, that can help you. So yeah, definitely ask around. And also I think another important point is if there isn't any sort of thing set up in your own community, ask 
um, like sort of look at who you can ask in order to set something like this up maybe talk to the local councillor or whoever's sort of in charge and it shows great initiative as well and you can set something up for your community and sort of gaining more experience this is more sort of to do with the medical side of it but making sure that your medical knowledge is sort of being kept up to date as well so whether that that mean I appreciate it is very hard to gain me, um, medical work experience and shadowing you know healthcare professionals during this time but it doesn't have to be in person you can just if you're just sort of keeping up to date with medical news any recent medical advancements or any research anything like that just sort of yeah keeping up to date with it and also future learn it's a great website on which universities put different courses and you can do them in your own time and they're sort of, I think, two or three hours a week. And they go from sort of the structure of the NHS to um, caring for somebody with dementia. There's a real variety of courses you can do on this website. And they're completely free as well. So that's definitely a good thing to have a look at, especially during your gap year when you've got the time to do these extra things. It's really good. And the next point, it's about sort of experiencing a different role within the healthcare team. So this is for when restrictions hopefully ease a bit and you will you might be able to go and get some in-person experience but if you have shadowed a doctor um it might be helpful for you to shadow somebody on um, sort of another member of the healthcare team in order to make sure you're making an informed decision so for me I shadowed a pharmacist for about a week or so and it sort of gave me another perspective of a role within the healthcare team and it allowed me to sort of make sure that I was making the right decision with choosing medicine because obviously there are things that are similar between pharmacists and doctors but there are many differences as well so if you've shown that you've got a good insight I think that's really important and if you are focusing on your grades and of resetting exams or perhaps changing your um, learning and revision methods so looking back at the past year and seeing what worked for you and what perhaps didn't work so well. And especially during your gap, you've got the time to try out different learning methods and techniques, maybe every month or so you can try out a different one and see what works best for you. Yeah, next slide please. Yeah, so another thing that students do during their gap year is getting a job. And again, this job doesn't have to be related to healthcare. I think that's the most important thing. I know when I, at the start of my gap year, when I was sort of looking for a job, I thought that it had to be related to medicine. It, in order to help my application, it most certainly doesn't have to be related. I think the most important thing is the skills you're using in that job and being able to relate the skills back to medicine. So for example, if you've got a job working in a supermarket, you will be coming into contact with members of the public every single day. They'll all have different backgrounds. They will all be of, sort of different ages. There may sometimes be a language barrier. You might have to change how you speak to an elderly person and how you'd speak to a sort of a child depending on you know, their age um, in order to best help them. And that sort of relates a lot to what a doctor's role is. So they do come into contact with many members of the public. They have to change and adapt their communication skills in order to best help the patient. So if you can sort of draw the parallels between whatever job you're doing and how it relates to medicine, that's the most important part. And yeah, it's a great way of earning money before starting university. And it also allows you to develop crucial skills needed not only as a medical student, but as a doctor as well. So these include organization and time management, because if you're sort of, if you've got a job as well as reapplying to medicine, it does show that you manage your time quite well. And it also shows that you're using your time in a productive way, which is what universities will want to see. And this is sort of to do with extracurricular activity. So I definitely say, any hobbies you currently have, and if you do take a gap year, keep up with them. I think that's a really important thing to stress. Even when you get to university, try and keep up with any hobbies that you have, because as well as reapplying to medicine, your gap year is also a year out for you. So ask yourself, is there anything personally that you'd like to get out of it? 
or if there's perhaps something that you've always wanted to do but never had the time um, because of you know other work use this as your opportunity so for me I had always wanted to learn how to sort of play the keyboard but I just never got around to it and during year 13 I'd always just sort of put it off and at the start of my gap year I made that a priority I said I'm going I really want to take some time out and learn how to play so if there's something that you know a skill that you've always wanted to learn just take this as your time to do it and yeah it's a perfect it's a, a great time to start a new hobby and also it's vital as has been mentioned um in this talk it's so important to take time out for yourself to avoid burnout don't focus solely on your application but definitely take time to unwind because the year is so much more than just reapplying to medicine um, it's a chance for you to develop your own personal skills and I think another thing that I'd like to mention here is it can be quite hard when you don't have the routine of going into school and being told what to do to actually sort of differentiate your time and sort of separate your work time and sort of your rest time so having a routine or making sure that you are sort of dedicating perhaps if it's every morning that you like to rest or every evening just making sure that you are taking that time out I think it's so important for your mental and physical well-being next slide please um so this is just a bit about sort of misconceptions that I know that I had before taking a gap year and reapplying so I thought that taking a gap year meant that universities would look at my application so differently. They know that I'd taken a gap year and they wouldn't want to take me, but it, that's just completely false. Um, universities will want to see that you've used your year in a productive way and you've used it to gain as much experience as, as you can. So all of the skills that you're developing during your gap year is what universities will want to see. So don't think that they will look at it differently because they won't. So many people take a gap year and some universities even encourage their students to sort of take a gap year as it really is an opportunity to sort of um, become more independent and really mature, uh, become more sort of mature before starting uni. And I also thought that I'd be one of the only ones who had taken a gap year. Again, this was so false. I came to university and I realized that everybody has had such different routes into medicine so whether that be that they've taken a gap year done a gateway course or are postgrad or are straight from school they you will find people that have taken such different routes and like definitely people will have taken the same route as you so don't think that you'll be the only one that's taken a particular route in into medicine Yeah, so I just wanted to sort of finish off by saying definitely use your gap year to your advantage. They are a great chance to open your mind and meet people that you wouldn't have ordinarily met. And the varied experiences that you sort of ha uh, have sort of during your gap year, they're a great way to strengthen your application. And if you do decide to get a job, it means you're gaining key skills, which will help you as a student. I found that it really having a job during the gap year it really sort of gave me an insight into professional life and it matured me a lot before starting university and the independence also is uh, really helpful in preparing you for university and I think this has already been mentioned as well but it allows you to have a break before starting university so I know that obviously year 13 it can be a really stressful year and going straight from that into medicine which is also quite stressful it can seem like a lot so if you've had that time out and taken time out for yourself to sort of refresh before starting uni it means you've I don't know you sort of start afresh and you don't have you don't have the stress of year 13 sort of still lingering which is really good and also this is another thing that you can mention in personal statement or at interview but taking a gap year and reapplying it sort of shows how resilient and determined you are to study medicine because everybody knows medicine it's you know it's a really tough application process so the fact you've gone through that twice it does show you are committed and yeah so make the most of it and I think the main message of sort of my talk is don't take it personally if you don't get in or if you are rejected but just use it as an opportunity to develop your skills and gain more experience.
and yeah, take a break. And that concludes my talk. Thank you everybody for listening and good luck with all of your applications and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so, so much. And we also have Mayuri and Gabs on the call who are both graduate entry med medical students. So uh, they can answer a question. I think Mayuri has done a BSc before and now is in, on the undergraduate medicine um, course, whereas Gabby has done a degree before and now is doing grad med. So if you have any questions regarding that also, please come down. Um, yeah, write them down. Um, so Rabia, they're asking you if you planned to take a gap year or was it a discussion you had with yourself after, after offers? Um, no. Oh yeah, so for me personally, I hadn't planned it. I hadn't even considered it during year 13. I always thought that, you know, gap years what I wasn't going to take when I was just gonna go straight to university. So it was after results day that I had decided because I knew that I didn't want to take my fifth option um, so it was then that I decided to take a gap year. Thank you and then what job did Rabia get during Covid because it's so difficult and did she have any prior experience? Yeah, so the job I got, it was just sort of working at a, a clothes shop. Um, that was at the start, I think, in September. So that was before COVID. And so I only got to work there a couple of months because then obviously we were put in lockdown. But I didn't have any prior experience of working sort of in a professional environment before. Um, and then during lockdown, um, of course, I couldn't go in and work. So I just sort of had a look at what else I could do during that time. And that's when I looked more into the voluntary work, which was still sort of, they were still requiring volunteers. Thank you. And another question we have is, if you don't get into medicine the first time, what's the, be what's the best option to choose between biomedical sciences, biochemistry or pharmacy? What do you guys think? Uh, um, I would say any of them are pretty good, to be honest. They all still apply to medicine. Um, personally, for me, I did biomed, so I think biomed is pretty good. And it covers both clinical stuff and, like, the sort of research aspects of science, where perhaps the other two, I guess biochem is definitely more research-based and pharmacy is more drugs-based, so go with whatever you prefer. I don't know, Gabs, what do you think? Yeah, so just go with your preference and what you think you'll enjoy most. Uh, honestly, at Warwick, we have people who did nursing, people who did pharmacy. And at war, we even have people who have done physics or English literature because they accept non-science backgrounds as well. Um, so again, there isn't like a preferred or specific degree that you should be doing. Like Mayuri said, a lot of people tend to do biomedical science. Again, because a lot of courses do offer like a transfer route into medicine for selected students doing that degree. Uh, but I wouldn't stress out about, you know, which one you have to do to maximize your options as long as you get the relevant work experience during that time and you learn something from it, you can still talk about it in your interviews. And in reality, actually doing a degree and then applying uh, will teach you so much about like how you study best. Uh, you know, you can talk about your experiences of what you've learned from that and it will also make you a strong, stronger candidate for doing medicine later down the line. So it's not the end of the world if you don't get in straight away. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gabby. And just with that, a follow-up question regarding Warwick only accepting graduate students. I think the course is only a four-year course, like Swansea, isn't it? Um, yeah, Warwick is a four-year course. Uh, so you literally start in first year, uh, have one year of kind of preclinical, which is mostly lecture-based, and then you're sent off to the world uh, to chat to patients and experience everything. So it's quite intense because it's basically like a five-year degree condensed into four years. So you still have to do a lot of the different components a medical student does. Uh, but again, if you're passionate about medicine, you can do it and you enjoy it. That's the most important thing. Thank you. Um, so as always, guys, you are inundating us with questions and I apologize if we don't get to all of them. Um, people are asking how the transfer from biomed to medicine works. Do you usually study biomed at uni and then move to another uni to do medicine? I don't really understand. Can you explain? 
I think it varies depending on what university and what course you go for. So for me, during during Queen Mary doing it at Bymouth, they've changed it again. But basically, in your final year, you get ranked um, as the top 15 amongst like three or four courses. And you all got guaranteed interviews based on your undergrad score. But that has now changed. So what they do is they rank all of you and then based on your UCAT score and your um, like overall average over the last two years that you'd completed, you then get the top five, get a guaranteed interview for the graduate entry program. And then the top 20, I think it is, or top 15, top 20, get a guaranteed interview for undergrad. Um, I know George's offers a transfer, right, Gabs? Uh, yeah, so George's, when I was at St. George's, offered it, but now they've also changed how they do things. Uh, so again, it won't be the same as when I was there because things change literally all the time, which is a lot of the questions that keep being asked. We keep saying, you know, do check the website so you have the up-to-date information, especially if you're in year 11 or 12 right now, things change constantly. Um, but yeah, with transfer at George's, it's a similar thing where based on your grades in first year and second year of university, they kind of put you in a ranking. And then if you make the certain criteria, they offer you an interview. And then depending on how people did in that interview, they will offer you the pathway to do the transfer route essentially. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, do check that criteria because places vary. And places like King's have like 20, 20 I think, uh, offers for post-grad, for example. Probably. And there's like, at Georgia's there's quite a few transfers, but the numbers do vary. Whereas somewhere like Warwick, you have 200 people who are all doing post-grad medicine as well. So it does vary by each uni. And the same process applied, like you still have to make your application through UCAS and you still got to, even if you have that guaranteed interview, it's not an extra to the four. You have to put it on your UCAS being like, I oh, want to apply to Kings or Queen Mary for graduate entry and undergrad. Like it takes up your options, but you know you have that interview. Um, so I guess that's the safe bet if that's something you want to consider for your fifth option. Um, but, and you have to apply using the university buzzword as well so that they can give you a reference rather than apply independently. It's the same like you do at school where they give you your school buzzword. That's great to hear, thank you. And do you still get funding for a postgraduate degree from the government? Uh, yeah, so if you apply for the postgraduate route like myself, it used to be different a few years ago, but now if you apply for the direct postgraduate route, you will get funding. So you'll still get your tuition fees covered. You can still get maintenance loan and things like that. But with the caveat that in your first year, uh, you have to have three and a half thousand that you pay out of your own pocket towards the tuition. Uh, so myself, I spent a summer working uh, just to make sure that I had that money before I started doing my postgrad degree because there would be no way I could afford it otherwise. Uh, but yes, yeah, so that's the only bit of money that you have to have from your own pocket. And from that point, you get support from student finance, NHS, and it's no different. If you do apply as a postgraduate student, but for an undergraduate degree, then unfortunately you will have to pay uh, from your own pocket and that doesn't get covered. Uh, so when you do apply, just be careful that if you're a postgraduate student at that point, if you apply for a five-year course, you will have to pay. My biggest <laughs> advice for that is uh, having to do that. It's hard. <laughs> it's pretty hard. You do get given maintenance loans, which is always good because health degrees are considered like if you do that as a second degree, you will always get maintenance loans for it. Every other degree, if you switch to, let's say, geography or media or English or um, even like biomed as your second degree, you won't get that maintenance loan. Um, so doing stuff like medicine and dentistry gives you that opportunity. Um, I personally, my best tip for you was, would be if you are, end up, if you end up having to consider doing an undergrad degree, is try and apply to a uni for like biomed or something close to you. Because if you live at home, you save so much money. And especially if you're a Londoner, it's not that bad traveling. If you can then like obviously make up for it by staying at uni and obviously socializing. Um, but yeah, definitely that helped. I unintentionally applied for Queen Mary for Biome. I just picked it because the grades met what I had and what I was predicted. And then it turned out I saved so much money from just like not having to live out. I did still live out and save money, but it does help if you apply to somewhere that's perhaps closer to you at home. But don't feel like that limits your choices. You can always do get summer jobs and things like that. Um, if you look hard enough, especially as you're over 18, by that point, it's so much easier to get a job as well. Um, and if you drive, it makes it even easier to get jobs. So 
do consider that as options as well. Thank you. Um, next up we have, do, university give, do universities give feedback as to show, or like as to how to strengthen your application after rejection? Um, I had three rejections and I didn't get any feedback. I'm not sure if that, like if those were the unis that I picked personally, because then I ended up with my um, like fifth option offer and the offer to come to study medicine at ARU. Uh, but the other three didn't give me any feedback. How about you guys? Yeah, I'd say the same. I didn't get any feedback um, from the unis that I was rejected from. I think it's because they do get so many applications, they can't sort of individually give you feedback. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anybody else has received that. Yeah, they tend to not give you direct feedback because the amount of people that they would ask and request a feedback, they'd be quite overwhelmed. Sometimes if you do request it, depending on which university you requested from and depending for the reason for your request, they might grant you that. But it's quite unlikely that you'll get any personal or direct feedback on what on how you've performed or how the station have gone. Yeah, like theoretically, Queen Mary is supposed to because we write up loads of feedback as like a student on the panel this week and we got told write everything down so that in case they get rejected, they know why they got rejected and get the points back. But obviously... There will be loads of you emailing at the same time so just bear that in mind when you send an email asking for your feedback because who knows if they'll actually reply the admissions team get inundated all the time so thank you and the last question really is um that's big this one what does medicine graduate entry mean because some people are asking that they are unaware of that means are you, do you want to take it off or shall well, I? Uh, you should probably do it as the grad. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so graduate entry essentially just means that you would have done a previous degree. So like myself, I've done biomedical science at St. George's. So it means that I've done a three-year degree uh, for university. And then after that, I'm applying because I've already done a previous degree. So that's that in a nutshell. It gets a bit confusing once you become a postgraduate with like four year course still being an undergraduate on the system and things like that. But that's all that means on the surface. You would have done a previous degree and then you're applying again for university. But the funding, I would, I would add to that that the funding is, can, can differ whether you're basically going on to a graduate degree, which is a designed four year course, or if you mm -hmm. do what I did, which is basically went on to the UCL undergraduate, but as a graduate. Yeah, I think that was kind of covered in an earlier answer as well. But again, good reminder just to make sure that when you're applying for finance, just remember whether you apply for a postgrad course or undergrad course, your funding will be affected in that regard as well. Yeah. And again, one final thing I want to say, guys, you most of you will be in year 11 or year 12 here. These are just kind of trying to tell you this is not the only route into medicine. So do not stress out, like focus on getting the grades, focus on making application as strong as possible. And if it doesn't go to plan, just know there's other options to get into medicine. And if it doesn't go well on the day, it's not the end of the world. And in reality, a lot of us who got into medicine via different routes will tell you that you, we're happy with how things went and are actually grateful for all the life experiences we had in, in, to get there, if that makes sense. So again, you're fantastic for being here today and do not stress out too much about all the minutia details of, you know, how does this work or how does that work? Because for all you know, you will get that offer and you will be an undergraduate medic in like a year's time. So do not stress out too much. Yeah, yeah. I think said really is the truth. Like focus on getting those grades because I always say to people like medicine is always there for you at the end of it. Like it's not going anywhere. Um, so just focus on yourself and if you don't get interviews if you don't get that person statement nailed if you don't get great you can't be mad. just focus on your a-levels like it's fine we'll it next year or the year after or are doing a degree and then applying or you know we have people on our courses that are 50 that have had their life forced and go actually I'm going to do medicine now like it's, it's perfectly okay there's no like number as to how old you have to be to do medicine so take it easy guys yeah, so, if medicine is for you, it will find a way to get you, basically. And if you're passionate enough, you will get there one way or another. So don't stress out. So I guess one thing that we haven't really talked about is clearing an extra. However, 
it's a good thing that we have some Q&A time at the end. So this talk is done. Thank you so much, Rabia, for your help talking to us about your gap year experience and too easy for pre-recording us a video about our own experience. We're gonna give you guys 10 minutes of a break. Please stretch your legs, go to the toilet, get a cup of tea, come back in 10 minutes for the last Q&A of the day. Um, I am aware that so many questions weren't answered, but so, so many are very specific. So um, if you still have those doubts, please just DM us um, about it, okay? Perfect. So we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you guys. So why we are on a break, we are really grateful for all of the kind messages that you guys have sent through the Q&A. However, 
um, we would be super grateful if instead of writing it there, you wrote it in a Google review for us. Um, so the code is bit.ly slash review into med and hopefully Charms can bring it up um, now. Also cheekily while you guys are writing like, thank you so much, this is very helpful. I was answering you by saying, thank you, please put this in a review. So maybe I've already asked you, but you never know. And yeah, you can see it here. And there's also the link for the post-conference feedback form. And there's also the link for our reflective blog post. Remember that all of the rules are there on the Google form. Email us if you have any issues at all. However, we think it should be quite self-explanatory. And remember for some extra points to use the reflective cycle, because that's something that you're gonna be asked to do throughout medical school. So you better start early. You're all keen beans here following us throughout the weekend. So I'm sure you will be super great at it. And you'll get a certificate for submitting it and the best 10 blog posts will be featured on our website which is definitely something you can talk about in your applications. Um, and should we get started with the Q&A, guys? Yeah, I think there's a question for Brian, actually. Oh, good thing he's back now. Hello, hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Someone's, someone's asking you a question about to get the PhD, what courses would you take? Um, so I think, wow, it's very early to be thinking about doing a PhD. <laughs> um, I don't think at that age I even knew what a PhD really was. Um, I would say don't worry about it. But like, uh, so, but a PhD, you can get a PhD in anything. It's, uh, it's, uh, and there's no right time. I think that's something that people ask about. It's the right time is when you have found something you really love, and something you really enjoy. Uh, I think I should let everyone know that I'm the the only person at my medical school who did a PhD this year, you know, there's one in every thousand medical students who do a PhD this early on. Most people say it's too early. Um, so just to give everyone a back bit of a background. Um, uh, so I'm, well, so I'm Brian, I'm the founder and the president, so, but I'm a, I'm an MBBS PhD student, which means, so I've done, I'm doing the medical degree, the MBBS pit, and you've got a slash, and then a PhD. So that's why I'm at uni. This is my ninth year at university. I've just finished. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's actually something that you will see. Some unis now offer it. Like for example, Imperial, if you go on their website and search MBBS PhD, you'll, you'll be able to learn about it. Um, it is for the academic minded. So some of you might know some academics in your uh, family or close family friends who, and they, that might be why it's, you know, people are interested. But um it's a big, it's a big step. Try and speak to people who were uh, involved, who have been involved in research in the past. Um, if that's something that people want to do, I mean, to do, maybe give a talk about it. The, the MEBS PhD uh, is something that probably won't um, interest most people, but um, that is definitely something I can do a talk on. If you write that in the feedback, um, no, I'm happy to talk about it. But I think for the for the general crowd now, the thousand plus people, there'll only be a handful. So I think I'll leave that to, to another day. Um, but uh, the answer to the question is, uh, you can do a PhD in whatever you like. I'm interested in, in heart research. I want to be a cardiologist. Um, and the opportunity appeared uh, where I could do a PhD in cardiology at Imperial. Um, and I took it. Yeah. But I can, I can talk about that another time. Great. Um, people want to add you on Instagram, Ryan. I'm not sure if that's incredibly professional of them, but um, just add the into med school one. And yeah, yeah, just add into med school you. because whenever Brian posts something that is medicine related, Mayuri just reposts it in the yeah, stories. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so I think that's the way. Um, and you guys also followed some of us yesterday. I think we decided that we are not going to accept you if we have a private profile just because yeah anyway brian so many people are asking you how your application was oh how yeah you felt so, throughout gcse's a levels yeah. did you so do any work experience i feel like they've seen a lot of our faces so <laughs> now they just wanna yeah. know you yeah of course um so i 
was actually quite I was quite fortunate in that I went to a grammar so a bit of a background uh, my family obviously Chinese but I moved to the UK when I was six um, and I came from Australia so I actually missed a year of school because the years are different um, so when I came to England I really struggled with English because I was a year behind everyone else um, I was some weird Chinese kid with an Australian accent but didn't look Australian so um, didn't have the best time at school but um, then I was very fortunate in that the secondary school that I went to I had um, biology teachers who were very um, helpful and saw that I was I wanted to achieve a lot my mum was a nurse so that's how I got into medicine I did the classic work experience thing that everyone does went to follow a surgeon decided that wasn't for me too much standing on my feet went to a GP, um, was a bit nicer. I liked the interacting with people. So I was like, okay, yeah, medicine's still something something for me. Um, and the thing I really enjoyed was uh, my work experience with uh, at an old people's home. Obviously you guys are gonna be limited in the experience that you can do now. Um, but I really love that. I love talking to um, elderly people, just learning about their lives and that and sort of interaction. And then, yeah, worked hard, GCSEs, got, did okay did good did well um a's a stars um, um but uh the thing i learned is that you, you actually um have oh, sorry uh, um is that um if you ask for help there are people that are out there for you um who would, would help you um in terms of for, for me like for example my english was really bad so I, the librarian i'm sure that this was covered in the in the personal statement talk and we'll be talking about personal statement later in the summer um but uh, i had a lot of help um from the librarian who helped me um and i'm very grateful to her to this day um and then yeah i did the a levels i went i did the classic double double maths Biology, chemistry, uh, biology and chemistry. Went to Cambridge. So a lot of people. Uh, I think I mentioned it yesterday as well. But like, don't worry about. A lot of it comes down to luck, um, in terms of where you go, where who accepts you, who rejects you. Um, I only had one offer, and that was from Cambridge. I got rejected from Imperial, UCL, and Kings. Um, they none of them wanted me. Um, but I was very fortunate that I just about got an interview at Cambridge. Loved it. I loved the interview. It was so much fun. Um, it's a bit strange to, probably to say, but um, it was, I had the best time just like, because I just really enjoyed learning and being in that slightly difficult situation, but um, challenging situation. Um, and then spent three great years at uh, Imp uh, at. Cambridge before I moved to Imperial. Someone asked me uh, the question yesterday about that journey. Unfortunately, uh, you can't do that anymore, move from Cambridge to Imperial. Um, I know some a lot of people will be interested in doing an Oxbridge talk later in the summer, perhaps. Um, and I'm, I'm, if, you, if, if, if you would be interested in that, do put that in the comments. But uh, I'd be happy to talk about the Oxbridge experience because it is slightly different to um, the application is slightly different to uh, other universities due to the collegiate system. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't think I actually answered the question. Where <laughs> no, I think you kind of did. Like you explained how you did in GCSEs, A levels, your work experience. So yeah. I think it's good. No worries. Okay, so we said we would talk about clearing an extra because we didn't really focus on that or rather people didn't really um, ask about that. But I think it's still, maybe it's because not everyone knows what we're talking about. Um, so basically, the way you can add an extra choice, which I think you can do from February onwards, is if you have an ad, if you didn't apply for five choices, which in your case would be four of medicine and one of a fifth degree. So you can still add courses and on the UCAS website, you will see which courses you can add. These are generally courses that are not already oversubscribed like medicine. Um, so you can do that already if you've only applied to four uh, universities from February onwards, but also you can do it like for example in May, if you haven't received any offers, from your medicine applications or from your fifth option, um, you can also add an extra course. Um, and then there is clearing, which is generally like close to results day. 
which is when universities still have vacant places. So most people trying to get through, like through clearing into medicine by ringing up the university and saying, listen, this is my UCAT. This is the grades I've achieved today. Do you have a spot for me for interviews? And I know that there are some unis that frequently go on to clearing. But if you use websites like the student room, there's often updated lists of what goes into clearing each year. And, um, but of course you still have to pass your interview. If you're unsus unsuccessful, you can always get into a course like the graduate, like in, into a course that will then allow you to do graduate entry, which Mayuri, um, Adrian, and Gabby have already talked to you about. Now, I get that this is a lot of information, and also I didn't, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I've explained this well, slash if anyone else wants to add anything to what I've said. I think all. I've explained it pretty well. I think it's it's easier to like picture on a flow chart, I feel. So we can do something like that, maybe like a timeline like Lee's done for us already. Yeah. yeah and I think the only one thing I would add, Anna, is that for some people, they would have, you know, done the UCAD or the BMAT. They would have had interviews. They would have done everything in the kind of correct way of like, or the classic way of trying to get into medical school, but it just doesn't happen. Uh, so, so, you know, they might not have put a fifth choice down or anything like that. That was absolutely everything was spot on that you said there. But it might be a case that you get to your results day and it turns out that you've done better than expected or you've achieved everything that you wanted to achieve. And because as it happens for some people, their, pre their predicted grades won't become the grades they get on the day the offers that they would have gotten suddenly become available from those medical schools because they want to have students who have gotten those grades to be part of the medical program, if that makes sense. So that's why they basically reject some people, but it means that there's places they can offer to you guys, which is why on the day, it's important that you know, you've know you done the UK CAT, you've done the BMAT, because they might call you might call them on the day and they will ask you, what was your UCAT score or what was your BMAT score? and then they might invite you to an interview through clearing. So don't feel like, oh, I'm not gonna do it this year because I know my predicted grades are bad or anything like that. Because even though they might not ask you, still try your hardest because you never know what's gonna happen throughout the application process. Like I think a lot of people mentioned yesterday and today, you know, sometimes people feel like, oh no, I got bad predicted grades at the end of year 12. Those can change when you start year 13, if you've worked hard throughout the summer or you have, you're in good contact with your teacher. You might think you've done terribly at the UCAT, but the BMAT goes beautifully and suddenly you still have lots of interviews depending on what university you apply to. So again, don't think it's the end. Just keep trying and keep pushing yourself as much as you can. There's also adjustment, isn't there? So like if you do get the higher grades, you're more likely to get stuff through adjustment, whereas clearing is kind of everything and anything. Yeah, um, and I think the one thing with clearing as well, it's not offered by all universities and it's quite new for medicine because it wasn't a thing a few years ago, it's fairly new. So do check which universities offer clearing for medicine and do make sure you have those numbers ready on the day if you think that's the option for you. I also think that it also bear in mind wait lists. So I know that some people get waitlisted for interviews. I personally was after an interview for a graduate entry and then didn't get anything. But one of my friends did it, it was his only like thing on his list. So he got three rejections got a wait list for Bart's graduate entry and the day after everyone confirms their place as to where you want to go he suddenly got an email from the university going you have an offer so do have some hope obviously don't put all of your like eggs into one basket but there is like there is hope that you'll all get there eventually and so just be prepared for anything that's great to hear. So I guess this might link up with the question like that has been asked quite a few times. Um, sorry for not getting to it earlier on. Um, what's the difference between doing a medicine course with a foundation year and another degree and then try for graduate, graduate entry medicine? And do you think either or option is better? And if so, what degree do you suggest people pick as an undergrad? to do before graduate medicine. So I guess there's loads okay, of questions so there. I... First of all, yeah, yeah. foundation year with medicine versus undergraduate degree and then graduate medicine. And is either or the better yeah. option, basically? 
Okay, so the way foundation year works, essentially, it's kind of like you have your standard five year medical degree. And before you begin that, you have an extra year before you start first year of medical school, where it's they call it foundation because you still learn science and you still learn different elements of medicine, but at a slightly simplified level, for the lack of a better phrase, where they're trying to bring you to the standard of a first year medical school student. And once you've done that foundation year from that point onwards, you're doing the exact same medical degree as someone who's doing undergraduate medicine straight away. So the only difference there is that you have an additional year during the six years where you cover some of the sciences and then you go from that point onwards. It tends to be that they have a lower grade kind of requirements to enter that foundation course. And it will also look at your background, for example, I don't know if you're from a certain area or if something didn't go as planned for your predicted grades, you're more likely to get entry through, through that way, if that makes sense. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add on the foundation side of things. But then for graduate entry, essentially, you would have done an undergraduate degree first. So you would have done something else for three years or four years or however many years your undergraduate degree is. And then after that point, you apply for a graduate entry course, which is tends to be four years or five years if you pick just the normal route five years after your three degrees, a three year degree, if that makes sense. And I know it's a lot of words and it's very complicated, but we will try to give you guys some resources to explain everything with that regard as well. Definitely. And I think always guys remember that this was just an overview of the medical application process. As we've done in the past, we will break it down onto more specific webinars. For example, we did the BMAT webinar, multiple um, interview webinars. Um, so don't worry about that. We will get to it closer to the time for the year 12s. I guess then the follow-up question from that is, if people choose to do an undergraduate degree before a graduate degree, is there any degree that you suggest, like any subject because there's actually quite a lot of them out there, like applied medical sciences, um, biomed, biochemistry, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology. Um, what do you guys suggest people do? I would definitely suggest stuff like the applied med sciences and biomed to give you like a good foundation. But obviously there's loads like do whatever you find the most interesting. So I know a lot of people were asking about psychology yesterday. And the advice I kept saying was I know based on some of my friends who are psychology grads, some of them did courses that were a bit more theoretical rather than scientific. So have a look into the courses. You've also got like courses like neuroscience, pharmacology, medical genetics. So whatever interests you, because some people I know that have done like med gen will end up going up and wanting to do more genetics related stuff in their medical career as well. So if something like the brain interests you a lot, then maybe do neuroscience. Then if you do medicine after that, then you might go into like neurosurgery or, or anything else. So just, yeah, anything that's a bit sciencey. And as Gab said, like, most people that do arts careers or business and finance do end up doing medicine as well. But some universities, not not all of them, but some a few of them will be like, it's not what they want on their list. So have a look and think about that as well when you're applying. I think Gabs has cut off her internet, so I don't know. What yeah, I think she might have, uh, but that's okay. Don't worry, guys. Mm, she's been answering loads of questions on the, on the Slido itself. Um, so let's see what else we can pick because there are many, many things. Um, let's do this one. What makes, what, oh, guys, okay. Some questions are hard to read. Anyway, let me try to interpret this. Um, what makes an interview successful? And is it possible to get an horrible interviewer? And is it good practice to interview yourself? Um, I personally, uh, so I've actually personally been an interviewer. Um, I've had quite a few interviews as well. Um, we've also, we've done talks in the past and we will continue, we'll help out um, with giving you the details of it. Um, but in summary, in general, it, it very much depends on the day, right? Um, it's, you can see, uh, okay, you leave and you're like, oh my God, that was, that was a horrible interview. I didn't know any of the questions in your head, but actually 
and that it, it could be that in the interviewer's head it was like wow i really pushed that candidate and they really just stuck at it and just kept going which is fantastic um it's very so it's very difficult to judge where it um how an interview went basically my my biggest top tip for interviews um i should assume you've still got you're all in year 11 year 12 um i guess some of you in year 13 but my biggest top my biggest tip and this was the last thing my dad said before i went into my interview uh, at cambridge um was smile and enjoy it they're not that they're not asking you to know the answer to the question like they don't expect you to be able to answer it straight away that defeats the whole point of it more cases if it's a science you want more often than not there is no answer or they're not expecting you to know the answer it's going to be a very very difficult question they want to see how you apply yourself um to what they ask you they want to know how you think so it's actually the way you present yourself it's just little things that you would have heard before like thinking out loud be engaged with the uh, examiner don't be staring off into space somewhere little things like that um just to show that you're really interested um are i think the most important uh things uh when you when you're in the interview and yeah, that was the last thing my dad said before. And he, he's a professor at Imperial, so he interviews hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And his message is always, is always smile, make sure, look like you're enjoying it. Um, and that is the best impression that you can give to the examiner. Um, can I just add to that very quickly? Of course. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I think uh, I agree definitely with everything that Brian said, but in terms of some of the structures, I think that we covered in terms of interviewing as well, treat them as a little bit of a um, sort of a fallback plan, because if you have certain structures readily available, uh, sort of just at the back of your mind, then often when you're confronted with a difficult question or an unexpected question, you do have something that you can utilize to start building up a structure. And usually you'll find that as you build it up, you become more and more comfortable and thinking back on it, you can say that, look, it was unexpected, it was weird, didn't quite know what to do with it. But, you know, I worked through it as best as I could. I had a structure that I followed, so I wasn't so again, helps you to focus so that you don't get that feeling of just rambling and, and, and not quite knowing what, 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 what to say next. So I would say utilize that as well because it's, it's just there as a sort of supportive mechanism. That's great, thank you so much. We'll only take a few more questions. People have been asking if they can do nursing and midwifery before they do medicine. And the answer is, I think only a few graduate entry medicine courses accept this. For example, Warwick. Can you confirm, Gabby, if uh, you're here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here, sorry for everyone, my internet cut off briefly. Uh, but yeah, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, if, for example, you were to apply to work afterwards, again, you would be more than welcome to. Do check the individual university requirements. I know we keep repeating it all the time, but they do change and we don't want to give you information that's not up to date. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in a midwifery or any other degree, and then you ent interested in doing medicine afterwards, uh, it wouldn't stop you from doing that. There's literally so many people who do all sorts of things. And then if, like we said, if medicine is something for them, they will find a way to do it. Whether it's, you know, afterwards you might do a master's degree or anything like that to get back yourself back in, or whether you go straight from undergraduate degree to postgraduate medicine. Again, it's all out in the open. And don't like put another healthcare career degree as a backup, I would say. Put it down yeah. because you want to do it. Because the thing is, I think people have this assumption that like nursing is a great backup or paramedicine is a great backup or midwifery is it's not. It's a separate career that is well respected and they they'll are, they will pick up on you if you've just done midwifery just to do a just to do it as a degree to get yourself into medicine. That's not how it works. Do midwifery yeah. because you want to do midwifery or do yeah, nursing because you want to do nursing yeah and yeah and that's a very important point because you will spend three years of your life studying that subject and you don't want to just do it for the sake of it you want to do something you enjoy 
Um, and at the end of it, you might realize, oh, actually, you know what? I like this more than medicine. Or you might think, oh, actually, you know what? I still like medicine a bit more. And that's not the wrong, like, that's not a problem at all. But just beware that you will still have to commit to it for three years. Thank you. And the last thing that we will answer is some people are saying that they really want to be doctors, but they don't want to do surgery. What other options are there um, as a career? So honestly, medicine has so many options within it and surgery is just like one of the specialties within medicine, but there's so many options within it. You can be you know, cardiologist, oncologist, like I could go on for hours listing all the different subspecialties. Uh, so obviously when you do your medical degree, you will all cover similar things. So everyone has a general pool of knowledge. So we will cover a little bit of anatomy. You will cover all those sorts of things, which someone like a surgeon might use later down the line. But if you do not want to become a surgeon and, for example, you don't like anatomy or you don't think that that's for you, you can still have so many options with the medicine and no one will force you to become a surgeon at any point, if that makes sense. I think, Anna, you might have a bit to add as well, because I know you no, are No, no, I think oh. it sounds really great. I just guess when when like you can download a whole list of specialties that there are, but at the same time, like I suggest not going into... Um, interview with a specific like into interviews with a specific um, specialty in mind to the extent that you tell yourself that you want to do that and that's the only thing that you're open to doing because I can ensure you that you change your mind when you're in medical school every single day and there's so many things that impact um, your choice at the end of the day for example if you do an amazing rotation in something that maybe you never considered but you get to work with an amazing team of people then it's possible that they make you fall in love with that specialty and that you change completely your mind however i think that it's still really early days for you guys so don't stress yourselves and say like oh i need to know what type of specialty i want to do after i get into medical school like cross that bridge when you get to it yeah, and honestly, there's people who finish medical school and they still have no idea what they exactly. want to do. And that's absolutely fine. There's also some people who think they want to know what they want to do. And 10 years down the line after training, they realize, actually, I don't want to do that anymore. So at no point do you have to like commit yourself per se. There's always other options. I remember um, getting told in my like first week, oh, 60% of you are going to become GPs. And like half the room went into shock going, I'm not going to become a GP. <laughs> so you don't know where you're going to go and just like enjoy med school and focus on that and do the things you love and let that bit come like cross that bridge when you get it, like Anna said. Uh, yeah. Guys, two two things like I'll, I, I just want to add to all of that. Most F2s don't know what where they want to apply most f2s which is your second year doctors will take one or two years out to figure that out so literally even most junior doctors at the stage of foundation f f1 and f2 years wouldn't wouldn't know and the second bit of advice which is probably the best advice i was ever given in terms of picking a specialty was don't look at the specialty look at the people doing the specialty, look at the consultants you interact with. Do you want to be that person in 10 years time and be that person for 20, 30 years of your life? If the answer to that question is yes, then that's probably the right kind of specialty for you. But look at the people doing it. And the best way really is through your placements at medical school, you will interact with a whole bunch of doctors. So talk to them, ask them, um, see what they are like, see how much they enjoy their jobs. And and even just being a medical student on rotation or being a junior doctor working a, 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 in a particular specialty will give you a whole different experience on it. So, yeah, I would just echo what's already been said. Just keep a very open mind because you never know what comes your way. Thank you so much for your contribution. It's been a really great panel. I know you guys must be frustrated because we couldn't get through all of your questions. We did try to answer most of them um, as a message if we didn't um, ask them out loud to our panel. Um, however, if there is still something that you have doubts upon, et cetera, consider emailing us, DMing us, et cetera. Um, on this slide, you can see that we have Google reviews. We have a post-conference feedback form, which will bring you to a certificate and that you should also fill if you want to enter our Medify giveaway. And we also have the 
link and QR code for our reflective blog post piece, which I suggest you consider looking at and writing. Uh, don't worry, all of this will be emailed to you and it's also in the YouTube description, so you will be able to find it later on. And unfortunately, we have come to the end of our day. Um, don't worry, many more events will come your way, including monthly Insta Lives uh, run by my Yuri and some people from our committee where you have time to ask questions and have your answers. Um, and now we'll just have a closing statement by Brian, our founder and president. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so um, thank you everyone for sticking with us over, over the weekend. Um, we, as you know, we, we're all medical students. We don't get paid for this. A lot of it's coming out of our own money, but we do this because we really just want to help you guys um, give you the advice and the help that a lot of us probably didn't receive at, at the time. I want you to all know, like obviously a lot of information has come flying at you over the last um, two days. Don't worry about it. Um, we, what we want to do is help you all uh, along that journey, whether in your year 11, year 12, or if you've got you know, an interview tomorrow, we will do the best that we can to provide you with the support. Um, and so we've got, as Anna said, we've got tons of events lined up. Um, we will continue to be uh, helping you through our events. Um, if you are interested in our mentorship program, you can sign up to that as well. Uh, fill out the form and we'll get in contact if uh, you fill our finding participation criteria um apologies if we haven't been able to answer your questions but um as you can tell a lot of, a lot of questions have come in which is which is really fantastic um and if we can just go back to that um that slide with the qr codes um I want, want as i said we're all volunteers and what we're trying to do is trying to get um a lot, as much support as we can so it would be fantastic. I know you guys at school, you must all be super, super busy, but if you can, um, it'll be fantastic if you could uh, fill out the forms there. So in particular for us, the Google reviews, we had so many fantastic reviews coming in yesterday, which is brilliant um, as we try and uh, get um, backing and support for our initiative. So Google reviews there on the left. Um, and then we've got the post-conference feedback form as well. So as you know, all of our speakers, our volunteers, they're all very busy with, you know, coronavirus, COVID. Um, a lot of them are medical students or doctors um, and very much appreciate them taking their time out. And the only thing they get in, um, they get out of it is these, uh, other than enjoyment of giving these talks, um, is these feedback forms. And it really means, you'll learn when you start um, your medical career these feedback forms are really important for our portfolios um so if you can if you have a couple of minutes it'd be fantastic if you could fill that out as well um, and finally uh we we want to help you give you the opportunities um uh that obviously a lot of opportunities have been taken away due to covid coronavirus uh, due to uh, covid so we have uh, we're trying to support you guys by giving the opportunity to write reflective blogs these are things that you can talk about in your interviews and help you st start thinking critically um, and would look uh, and it'll be great for us um, to see what you make out of the experience that you've had over the last two days so that's the reflective blog post on the right you can find some more information uh, from the qr code there but um, yeah, in general, I want to also say thank you to our sponsors that have, uh, that have supported us over the last two days. Um, and uh, in the bottom left, you can see our social media channels. Um, Mayuri, as you guys know, is our queen of uh, social media. Um, she's been fantastic in responding to a lot of the messages that we've had over Instagram. Um, thank you to Anna, and charms and the rest of the events team for putting this together anna is sitting exams a lot of the other people are sitting like really important exams at the same time as uh organizing these um these meetings uh, these uh, events um on the surface probably looks very calm despite the technical issues but they've worked absolutely tirelessly for the last month 
um, getting the speakers together, getting the format together, making sure everything um, is as useful as possible to you guys. So I want to say thank you to the girls for doing that. Um, thank you to all of our speakers who have taken up their valuable, valuable time um, to give this talk, um, to make this event possible really um and thank you for all of your questions for really engaging we've had an incredible incredible reception um over the last two days um and it's made it makes it all worth it when we see um, that we are helping helping you guys um but yeah that's everything from me uh and i'm happy to hand it back over to you to close yeah out. i guess one last thing is that some people have been asking if when they go to university they can become a mentor with us and you will be super welcome to do so i guess that's the whole point of the initiative that it becomes sustained like that it self-sustain itself by having mentees that then become mentors and can hopefully give back to other young students what they received from the help that um we tried to give um, but thank you so, so much for sticking with us throughout the weekend and go have some lunch, I guess, or <laughs> anything else. And please get in touch if you have any questions at all at events or the normal into med school at gmail.com and watch out for our next events, which are going to be A-level revision events. Yeah, also just to add to that, please keep an eye out for our emails today and tomorrow because I'll be sending out a mass email to all of you with all the links to the forms and uh, attend to any questions that you have and in two weeks time I will also be sending um, registration form as well as details for our next upcoming webinars as well thank you all